Professor Klafter, President of Tel Aviv University, colleagues and friends. I'm glad to open this symposium honoring the laureates of the Dan David Prize in Nanotechnology, the magic of small things. Uh, the symposium consists of three sessions. Each starts with the presentation of one of the prize laureate and then followed by two presentations of Tel Aviv uh, University scientists doing nanotechnology. Also, you can find at the lobby some, um, uh, some posters which represents nanotechnology research in Tel Aviv University. I hope you all enjoy the symposium and again, congratulations to the prize laureates. Uh, we'll start with a greeting of Professor Josef Klatter, please. Good morning to everyone, and uh, I'm very glad that uh, you are here. I would like to welcome our three laureates and uh, uh, thank them for coming to Israel. Uh, as we know, uh, this is uh, uh, by itself a statement. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to say that uh, nanoscience and nanotechnology are two small words, but they are, cover really a very broad uh, uh, interdisciplinary, uh, uh, I would say, idea behind them. And it fits very well to uh, our university, like in many other universities, they are very, very comprehensive. And Tel Aviv University, uh, on its side, took uh, actually a strategic decision over a decade, ago, a decade ago to really invest in nanoscience and nanotechnology by uh, establishing uh, a center that exists uh, uh, today and uh, was headed, among others, by Ori Chisnovsky and now by Yael Hanin. But also the state of Israel took a decision over well over uh, uh, a decade ago to invest in nanoscience and nanotechnology and establish the initiative for nanotechnology and one of the movers there and uh, the driving process was Joshua Jortner who is here and unfortunately uh, I think could not be here. So uh, altogether I think that over this uh, time uh, the investment in this area which means uh, recruiting uh, new faculty members and equipment I think we made a very, very, very large step and even leaps uh, from time to time because, you know, uh, the difference among the different centers for nanotechnology is really, uh, except for the brain power, is really uh, the, the resources. And from this point of view, uh, uh, I'm very happy where, where, where how we moved. Uh, now, uh, I, I would say that I would be very happy if this, I call it the magic of uh, small things. Yes, the magic should be that small things should not be that expensive. But uh, you know, this, uh, this is a fact of life. Nevertheless, in the, uh, I think within three years, we'll have a new facility, which will be the new nano building, which although it's called nano building, is one of the more expensive buildings we'll have on campus, but I think uh, it will really host at least part or large part of the scientists that are dealing with the nano related uh, uh, research. And uh, this will be really n not only more uh, convenient, but I think will give a push to the whole, uh, to the whole activity. Uh, in parallel, there are other things that really uh, we do which are related. We just inaugurated last week the Blavatnik uh, Center for Drug Delivery and Drug uh, uh, Discovery, which is by itself, uh, uh, I would say, an expensive and nice facility uh, that uh, deals with uh, nano, nano medicine. Yes, so we in chemistry used to argue that who needed the word nanotechnology, uh, chemistry by itself is, is nano. But you know, uh, uh, if you can raise funding by a new concept, I mean, this is... Uh, Yes, so uh, I would say that we're in the right way, and uh, all I have to say that last evening uh, the ceremony ended with nano dance, and uh, today I guess a nano choir. We have the three tenors, yes, Paul and Chad and John, and I hope that the choir around them will be uh, applauding and uh, I would say also taking uh, participate. So enjoy and thank you very much. So let the science speak now. 
We will start with uh, Professor Paul Alibasatos, very rich in accomplishments and other prizes, but uh, than David Price, including the Wolf, Wolf Prize in Chemistry, the Linear Spaulding Medal, the Von Hippel Award, and the American Chemical Award in Chemistry of Materials. That was for oh, Professor sorry, Mirkin. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, that was for Professor Mirkin. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should have this prize as well. <laughs> okay, Paul, well, please. Yeah. Okay. So maybe I just need to switch this. Is that? Uh, I saw what happened earlier. I think that's. So um, let me just uh, begin by thanking you and saying just how honored I am uh, to have been recognized with this award, with the Don David Prize, and how happy I am to be back with my friends in Israel. Uh, I, you know, I just say a word at the beginning that, to me, I feel like in Israeli society there's a deep reverence for all forms of human creativity, and that's a wonderful thing for any society to have. And so this award, I think, expresses that uh, real uh, cultural strength of, uh, of 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 seeking to, um, to to develop creativity in all of its dimensions. And I, and I think that's just wonderful. And uh, also to say that uh, over many years I've had many uh, interactions here with the people at Tel Aviv University. And, uh, and it's very thrilling to see the development of nanoscience here, uh, which is really becoming very strong. And um, so it's wonderful to be back with you and to have this opportunity to share some of our work. And in the spirit of the prize where we have uh, past, present, and future, uh, I will also take a few minutes uh, to talk about um, things that we have accomplished over time, uh, some from the past and some from the present and some from the future. Uh, partly also in order to give you, uh, those of you who are not from the world of science, uh, the um, tools that you need so that by the time you leave the room you are a complete nanoscientist and have all of the information that you need to go forward. Um, when um, I was a teenager there was this show in the United States television show um, Saturday Night Live which still exists and there was a little skit um, with a, a comic named a fellow who the character was Father Guido Sarducci and he had what he called once a skit which was the five-minute university. And in the five-minute university, you learned in um, five minutes everything that you would remember five years after you had uh, received a university degree in a given subject. <laughs> so this will be the five-minute university version of uh, nanoscience. Um, and so we'll say a little bit about, um, about quantum dots and then um, in, in, uh, past, and then a little bit about uh, present and future. So um, for me, uh, I will start with my discussion around uh, the scaling laws. And um, the earliest, um, uh, the, the phrase atom uh, in Greek means that which cannot be divided. And of course, um, what brought about the first thinking that the world might actually have atoms was a thought experiment in which you took a piece of gold and imagined breaking it into two and thinking, well, these two things are essentially the same. They have the same density, the same melting temperature. They are the same color. Uh, they basically are the same thing just divided. And if you continue in that thought experiment to divide it over and over again, at some point it becomes so tiny that um, Democritus reasoned originally, eventually it would become grainy, matter would become grainy, not continuous, and there would reach a point where when you divide it, it was no longer the same, it will no longer be the same, 
And in fact, there will be a point at which you divide it and you cannot divide it again. That's, of course, the atom or the indivisible, the unit, the grainy unit that makes up matter. And nanoscience sits right at that edge where material has first reached the point where when you divide it in two, the two pieces are no longer the same. And uh, the properties now depend upon the size. And so when we make um, a material uh, half the size, each time we do that, the properties all will change. And so, for example, the simplest one uh, to imagine is melting temperature. And here is a very early study of ours which measured the change in melting temperature of a crystal, a semiconductor crystal, as a function of its size. And so why does this happen? You can see there's an enormous reduction in the melting temperature as a function of the size of the crystal when it becomes very tiny. And you can easily imagine this because every atom in the crystal is linked to every other. And the more they get linked together, the stronger the crystal becomes. But if half the atoms are on the surface, they have no partner on the other side to link to. So they're a little bit easier to move around. And in fact, that surface to volume scaling is what leads to a variation of the melting temperature with something like one over the radius of the particle. So that's a famous scaling law. And in fact, it's quite important for what I'm about to um, teach you about. Now, here's the second scaling law that you need to know. And this is one everybody encounters at some point probably in their life. Uh, when you go to the jewelry store to buy a diamond for your significant other, uh, you are always faced with a dilemma, which is, uh, most people at least, unless you are in the 0.001%, at some point you have to decide uh, that there's a certain amount you're willing to spend, and that will tell you the size of the diamond you're going to get. And you could say, well, that's true, but what if I just doubled the size? <laughs> what would happen to the price? Well, it turns out it will go to four times. Uh, so that's a simple scaling law that we can all relate to very quickly because that pretty soon pl places a bracket on, on what size you're going to get. But why is that? Um, that's because um, you want to buy a crystal of high quality. That determines its optical purity. And uh, imagine now that you have a crystal which in the course of its growth, somehow a mistake has occurred. Uh, typically they happen. And so uh, at some point there is a, uh, an error inside this crystal that ruins its optical properties. And now you would like for it to go away. Well, it will eventually go away. It turns out the time scale is exponential with volume. <laughs> so as a crystal becomes larger and larger, the probability that a defect will eventually work its way out depends so strongly upon the size. And the consequence of that is that the diamond becomes very rare when it's large and high quality at the same time. It's unusual to find and it's difficult to make. Now, that's a non -equal, that is a kinetic defect, a defect that happened because of the growth rate. There are also equilibrium defects, which are ones that are present if just the number of atoms is very large, there will be a defect in there at equilibrium. But it turns out that for a typical inorganic crystal, a few electron volts, four or five electron volts per atom binding energy, the probability um, that there will be a defect in a crystal of a thousand atoms is actually quite small for equilibrium. Okay. So if there's a defect present because the crystal was grown uh, too quickly, then it will take a long time to anneal out if the crystal is very large. Well, in nanoscience, we turn that on its head, upside down. And it says, we say, okay, then if that's true for a really big crystal, what if my focus is on a really tiny crystal? If it's only 10 atoms across, the time to anneal a defect out is actually less, much less than a second. 
And in fact, because the melting temperature is low, what I just showed you a minute ago, I can take a material which ordinarily has to be made at a very high temperature under very complex chemical environment of extreme purity. And instead, I can take that material and grow it under very, very simple conditions at a low temperature. And the defects will simply go out to the edge. And because the crystals are so small, the equilibrium defects will only be one defect in very, very large number of tiny crystals. I can have a huge number of tiny crystals, and at equilibrium there will only be maybe one of those crystals has a defect inside of it. So as a consequence, one of the really beautiful things about nanoscience is that it's possible to make very perfect crystals, and that these crystals are very robust. Now, that doesn't mean you will always make perfect crystals. It's possible to even to make a nanocrystal very badly. But if you pay attention to the conditions, they favor the formation of a good crystal. And uh, one way that we saw this many, many years ago was by studying structural transformations in which we took nanocrystals and placed them at high pressure and temperature. And what we could show was that a crystal can change its volume by undergoing a structural transformation from a not dense phase to a dense one under pressure. And that when that happens, a crystal can change its volume by as much as 20, 30 even percent. And the crystal will stay intact. It simply changes its shape. And it can go back and forth and cycle between these two different crystal structures. That's a scaling law, by the way, which today finds its application, in a sense, in batteries. Uh, when we charge a, a, a lithium ion into a, a battery material, uh, there's a big volume change. Well, if it's made out of tiny particles, then the volume can change reversibly. And so that's an example of one of the scaling laws finding its use in, um, in um, practical energy technology. So one of the consequences of these areas is that it's possible to make high quality materials uh, rather cheaply and to make them at large volume. So uh, the quantum dots that you might have seen last night in the movie uh, that are made inside a, you know, original work in a tiny flask about you know, that big, uh, today uh, in a you know, factory nearby Berkeley uh, are being made um, at the scale of uh, 25 tons a year uh, and then you know, put into various uh, displays. So that it can scale very readily um, and the cost can remain uh, quite low. Now, um, so you've seen, you, you now are armed with uh, uh, two scaling laws, <laughs> melting temperature and the idea of a nanocrystal as a structural domain. Um, the somewhat more complex scaling law that turns out to be quite important is one that's intrinsically quantum mechanical. So our intuition starts to fail us a little bit, but when we have um, a, a, a crystal, um, inside of it, um, if it's a semiconductor material, we can promote an electron, a bonding electron, into a non-bonding state. That electron can move around the crystal now. That's how we get uh, all of our electrical uh, logic taking place inside a phone or something, is we've got a material where we can switch whether the uh, electron is conducting or not by promotion of an electron. And um, it turns out that that electron is a wave, or it's extended. It's not isolated into one bond, but it extends over a certain volume. And that extension um, is, in fact, um, a, a vital part of the behavior of small semiconductor particles, um, as was shown originally by Lewis Bruce. So if we look carefully inside a small uh, semiconductor crystal, the smaller it gets, the more the electron that is a wave is forced to occupy a smaller volume. And in that smaller volume, the electron is forced to move more and more quickly. As you compress it down, its motion becomes faster. Why that means that in order to create the electron, you have to give it that extra energy to move around. Hence, the band gap depends so strongly upon the size. Now, uh, there's something quite important about that. 
Uh, well, first of all, let me say that, uh, you know, there's some technical details here that I won't go through because they're technical and only, you know, of interest to people who actually study these things. But in any kind of material that you study, sooner or later there's a place where the wild things are. And these are things that you can't quite um, easily uh, uh, explain as, as much detail in a simple model as you would like. And in the nanocrystal case of the semiconductors, all the wild things are on the surface of the crystal. And the surfaces of crystals have been very, very hard to analyze. So in the future section, I will tell you our dream about how we might one day be able to measure the position of every atom on the surface of a nanocrystal. But to date, that's never been done. So here we have a funny new material. It's a basic building block of modern materials, a nanocrystal. And that building block, uh, we now can make very high quality, but about a third or a half of the atoms, we can't tell you their exact position yet. So that's why it's called the wild things. The good news is we can just eliminate that surface by burying it inside another. We can grow one crystal around another. And when we do that, this interface can become uh, very electronically well-defined. And that's essential to all of the actual uh, materials that are used. Now, one thing that's very important about these tiny crystals is that the electron, when it's excited, is very delocalized. It's delocalized over that crystal. And so um, I'd like us to stop for a moment and think about that and its applications for biology um, in the following way. Uh, imagine that I have a molecule, like an organic dye, uh, that has 20 atoms in it. So these are the colors that we use for food coloring or for clothing coloring and so on. Many of them are made out of organic molecules. And when we excite that molecule, uh, an electron is, a, a bond is effectively broken. One bonding electron is promoted to a higher excited state. And that excitation then relaxes by the emission of light. That's what a dye will do. And uh, the thing to think about is the issue of volume. It's a very simple idea. Namely, that if I have an organic molecule where there's an excitation of this type, and that excitation is delocalized over 20 atoms, the molecule is in danger of breaking. There are 20 bonds that hold the molecule together. And one is broken. And in the course of uh, that extra energy, there's extra energy inside that system, uh, there's a chance that it will come back by the relaxation that emits light. But there's also a chance that that energy will end up, in fact, rearranging the atoms inside that molecule. And that, of course, is what destroys the molecule. It's why if you take a colored fabric and stick it outside in the sun and you go back a month later, it's faded. So uh, a nanocrystal is quite different because that electronic excitation is now delocalized over 1,000 or 10,000 atoms. And as a consequence, the probability that the atoms will rearrange to break the crystal becomes very low. And this is fundamentally, at a very simple level, why it is that a quantum dot is photostable compared to an organic dye. It's also why it has a more narrow emission spectrum. The light that comes out is spectrally more narrow in energy because in the organic dye, when the excitation takes place, all the bonds change a little bit. The molecule essentially changes its configuration. And then when it comes back, again, there has to be another change. So that alternation of structure broadens the spectrum out. And the quantum dot, in contrast, has a much narrower spectrum. So the first application of these quantum dots uh, that we developed some years ago was, in fact, to take them and introduce them um, inside cells where they could be used for labeling. Here's an example of actin fibers um, in a fibroblast cell that have been decorated with quantum dots. And over here 
is the same kind of uh, fiber treatment, but with a common organic dye. And during the time that I was speaking, you could see that the dye bleached and the quantum dot uh, did not. And that's because of just what I told you about, uh, that they're more stable. So today, quantum dots are, are available for use, and about 10,000 research groups around the world actually uh, purchase and use quantum dots for labeling in various uh, medical research experiments. And um, in the event that you have um, a biopsy and somebody wants to examine the tissue, uh, most probably the tissue will be treated uh, with the quantum dots in order to image uh, the, the, the tumor and make some determination on it. There, most most uh, labs that use those things are using quantum dots. Now, the other place that these things have found a commercial use, these semiconductor materials that can emit light that are made in the ways that uh, utilize the low temperature and so on, um, is in displays. And uh, the way that is done is to have a blue light emitting diode uh, uh, underneath uh, that takes uh, electricity and converts it to blue light. And then on top, a film that contains the quantum dots inside, two sizes, a green and a red. And then that gives you the three blue, green, and red colors that are required, that combination of three, uh, to make any color that you might uh, observe with your eye. And um, these uh, quantum dot displays are quite interesting. You'll remember I told you that the emission spectrum is narrow, and also by changing the size just a tiny bit, we can tune the color. So, and, and, and we've learned how to control the sizes very precisely. And, and that's very important. Um, if you're used to at all looking at what's called a CIE diagram, it turns out that your uh, eye perceives three different colors uh, that are the peak points of the receptors in your eye, and every other color is made up by ratios of those that are impinged upon. And so the quality, the color quality of a display depends on the degree to which the three primary colors, red, green, and blue, that are used to build up all the others, the extent to which they actually match the corners of that diagram. The better that they do that, uh, and the more pure the color is, because if it's a very broad spectrum, then one channel leaks into the other. You're trying to denote green, but in fact some is appearing as red. Then that reduces your capability to make all of the colors be represented that your eye can see. And um, this white diagram, or all these white dots that you see here, are ones which were obtained by a person who simply went around in the natural world with a colorimeter <laughs> and measured the colors of objects that we encounter in life, okay? And um, then this uh, black one is the um, range of colors that's most probably reproduced by my computer display, which already is quite a bit better than what this projector can show. So there are many objects in the world that we encounter whose colors cannot be reproduced by uh, the uh, colors that are in a typical computer or telephone display uh, that's made with uh, conventional LCD technologies. Um, but uh, the yellow one here shows um, the typical quantum dot display that you would find in today's, for example, if you buy um, a, a, a Samsung television, uh, it, it will have in it uh, quantum dots. If you buy a new one from last year or this year, it will have inside of it uh, quantum dots, which will have this color gamut that you see here. And the next generation that's now uh, being produced but isn't yet quite available for commercial use follows uh, this uh, white uh, uh, line here that produces uh, an even higher quality, quality set of colors. So this is something which over time you're likely to experience as a, a display that you, in which you will be able to have the higher quality colors. Now, there are other technologies that may come in that are important, for example, OLEDs and others, but the color purity of the quantum dot display is actually um, quite impressive. And um, if you do come and visit me in Berkeley, you can come and see a whole bunch of these uh, around my lab. Now, the, um, shifting now a little bit, uh, that's the past. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about sort of present and future. Uh, so all of what you saw uh, is based off of making particles that kind of look like these that are pretty uniform in size and which have uh, a, a discrete number 
of atomic units in their size across, and that's controlled fairly precisely to make the different colors. Now, in the interim, uh, in the years since this was developed, uh, we have learned how to make um, what um, um, these other shapes of nanocrystals. And uh, when I talk about this, I often like to refer to a very um, famous phrase of, um, of Rutherford, who said that there are um, only two branches of science, uh, physics and stamp collecting. And uh, stamp collecting, I believe, was not considered to be a higher form of learning. Uh, and in fact, um, my students and I, we are very proud stamp collectors. Uh, here are our, this is our stamp collection. Okay, um, and what I mean by that is to say that there was a period of time when we learned how to take crystals and grow them in the lab in such a way that we could make them have a very wide range of shapes. And what I mean by that is we could make them in rod shapes, for example, but we could go way past that. We could make them branch at will. Uh, not just single branches, but if you like, we could make secondary, tertiary branches, and so on. Uh, we could make them into this kind of dotted pattern, uh, or we could make hollow crystals where there's a hole inside every one in the middle, or we could make crystals where there's one crystal, like a Russian doll, completely enclosed inside another, or we could make ones that look like P orbitals or F orbitals. I mean, we could make lots of different shapes, and they were all made empirically <laughs> by adjusting the kinetics of nanocrystal growth and other features of the reaction as a function of the time. We could change temperature, we could change concentration of the reaction species, uh, and in playing those kinds of tricks, we learned over a period of time to iterate, to follow empirically what would create this vast diversity of shapes. And they turn out to be really interesting shapes. For example, this is one where um, there's a little quantum dot right in the center of, uh, it looks a lot like a carbon atom model set. And in the center, there's a small quantum dot. And if you bend the arms, the luminescence changes color. Okay, So it becomes a force sensor that can be used, for example, to measure uh, when one cell presses against another, uh, it bends the arms. By cell, I mean, for example, a tumor cell, as it pushes its way out uh, to become metastatic, will generate a force. And that force, if you get that particle lodged in between, can be measured by how the fluorescence uh, shifts. So, so these shapes are very important. Uh, this can act as a little catalytic nanoreactor where reactants can be concentrated inside and, and, and various uh, uh, effects can be observed in that way. So each one of these shapes turns out to be quite useful. But from our position, we're saying that we should follow the admonition of Rutherford and try at some point to actually understand how it is that these things grew. In other words, to try to create a physics out of our stamp collection. And so uh, we're going to do that in a moment. And I'm going to skip over my luminescent concentrator, I believe, excuse me, but I don't want to go over my time, which I think I'm likely to do if I cover too many topics. So I'm going to switch now um, and go uh, straight to this topic of nanocrystal structure. And I mentioned to you earlier one of our frustrations, which is that I can pretty much tell you where the atoms are inside this crystal, but actually you can see that as it gets close to the edge, it loses our ability to say much about it. And uh, this is a projection, of course, uh, through a dense number of atoms, approximately equal in all dimensions. So we're going through a volume, uh, a, a, you know, a depth here that's equal to about this. So you can imagine that when we think about the edge, our ability to say where those atoms are becomes very poor. So, we have been trying over an extended period of time to actually find a way to observe the growth of nanocrystals in real time and to observe also um, all the details of their atomic structure. 
And a breakthrough for us took place um, some a few years ago now um, when we learned how to start to grow crystals inside the electron microscope, but in a liquid. And um, for there are some uh, people earlier in their career here. Uh, I'll relate a little bit of a story there that I think all the professors can relate to also. So I wanted to do this for about 10 years. And every time a new student would come to talk with me, I would say, you know, let's go and try to make a liquid cell and observe particles growing. And the students would get very excited. And then, you know, you have to talk several times typically before you find a resonance, right? So they would go away. And then, you know, the students would come back and they would say, you know, Professor, I've talked, to, I have this great other thing that I want to work on. And, and, and always they would come back and they would never want to work on that project. <laughs> and I'm a little dense. It took me like four years to figure this out. But eventually I realized, oh, uh, my other students uh, in the group, you know, th th this person would always go and talk to the students, of course, right? And the postdocs in the group. And they would say, run away. <laughs> This is, <laughs> this is one of Paul's crazy projects, don't go near it. Until one day there was a person named Jaime Zeng and she neglected to go and ask everybody else. And so she just tried and it turns out that it works just fine. Uh, it, although it actually in retrospect it probably shouldn't have and yet it does. So it's one of those stories. Um, but in any case, uh, we grow particles inside a liquid cell and over time, we've developed that into a special kind of liquid cell where the liquid is trapped between two layers of graphene so that the window is a single layer of carbon. And the consequence of that is that the electron beam is not um, uh, scattered too much by the window. Of course, it is scattered a lot by the liquid. Uh, which reduces our background, or creates a lot of background noise and makes it noisy. But you can see here an example in this movie of some platinum nanocrystals. We're taking very heavy atoms now in order to observe them easily. So if, you, if you've watched this movie what, uh, as, you, as it's been running here, what you will see, it has to go back to the beginning and you'll see it again. But what you'll see is small crystals growing inside um, the liquid. I'll just give it a moment here to kind of start over again. Um, and you'll just see at the very beginning these, there's nothing there and then you know the tiny crystals start to form. Come on, restart for me. Uh, or you can just see here the results of the final uh, crystals. You can see that they have um, some lattice orientations but also a lot, some defects inside them because they've been grown too fast and um, can't completely control that in the early, there it is, starting at the beginning. So you can see here, you can't see too much and then all of a sudden you'll start to see small crystals moving around and they're moving a little bit faster at the beginning and then they'll start to slow down and it turns out if you track those motions their, their speed is going like one over the size which is what you expect for a kind of diffusive process and you can see that periodically these crystals will fuse with each other and those are the characteristics that happen inside that particular system. So here we can observe the growth of this crystal. Now, there's lots of um, details inside that that I'm not going to go through that we've studied over several years. But what I want to go do is to this problem of the surface um, so that I can illustrate to you the aspects of the future in a sense. So um, imagine that we take in that movie one of those crystals and we simply observe it as it's moving. And now we subtract the center of mass motion. So we make it so that in each frame the crystal is in physically the same location, but of course it's rotating. So inside the liquid, the crystal is spontaneously showing all of its orientations. And as a consequence, we can observe this series of diffraction patterns from that single particle. And so this would be an example, for instance, of a particular example of an a single particle and these would be diffraction patterns where the background has been subtracted and what you'll see is that we observe many different orientations. And in the limit where we've collected say a thousand or so of those kinds of diffraction patterns, we actually now have enough information to go back and obtain the electron density uh, of every position uh, inside the crystal. And so uh, that's done by a kind of simulation. 
in which we start with a uniform density and we see what kind of diffraction pattern that would create. Um, and then we fluctuate, uh, we allow a fluctuation, uh, a Monte Carlo-like variation in the electron density and we see if that gets closer or not to the observed distribution of diffraction patterns. And then we repeat that over and over and over again uh, with a, both a discrete and a continuous uh, region uh, to that process. And if we do that enough times, eventually we're able to back out uh, the best fit that we can get for the amount of data we have and the amount of noise that's there. And uh, what we can get is the position of every atom in the crystal to a resolution of just a little bit worse than two angstroms, 2.14 angstroms. Now, the reason this is important is because the nanocrystals that we know how to make, no two of them are absolutely identical the way proteins are. <laughs> they just are not because we're not as good as nature is at making stuff with a thousand atoms yet. Uh, but uh, we are going to learn and we'll get better at it as time goes on. And the way to get better at it is to observe single particles. So this is an example. To my knowledge, this is actually the first example where the position of um, every atom inside a, a sample where every crystal is not the same, which is a typical human-made uh, construct uh, of this size, uh, we can observe the electron density inside it. You saw earlier that these particular crystals like to fuse, and so these are some of the fusion events that have taken place. Um, and if we look, for example, there's a grain boundary where some crystals fused, and we can go in now and say, here are all the atoms, and you can see this grain boundary is not flat. <laughs> and in fact, what happened in this particular crystal is that a, um, a, a 110 and a 100 face collided at a asperity at a single point, and then atoms filled in around from the sides, we could see that in the movies, and then they made a flattish surface, but in fact, the grain boundary, if you move all the way through the crystal, actually has roughness and fluctuates inside of it. It's not a completely flat grain boundary, the way you might think it would be if you could only look at a single projection. Now, this is not quite yet good enough to obtain the positions of the uh, atoms here at the surface, but it's close. And um, our goal is going to be to do some experiments in the near future where we are able actually to observe um, a core shell interface. I told, showed you earlier core shells. Uh, we're in the process now of measuring in some detail some core shell interfaces where we think we'll be able to see um, in some detail, the surface reconstruction. Um, so it will be a first version of getting at where the positions of the atoms are uh, inside one of these tiny crystals. Um, how am I time-wise? Do I have a few minutes or am I? I'm okay. Okay. So um, I showed you an example where we've obtained the structure of a nanoparticle and, and it had, it wasn't a perfectly formed particle I told you at the beginning that you could form particles that are quite perfect, but I also think I reminded you, if you grow them too fast, even a tiny crystal can be messed up, and ours were, had, you know, these grain boundaries inside them, which we did as an exercise, partly we wanted to see that so that we could find uh, some richness to a structure uh, that we could observe by this technique, uh, and then slowly refine it from there. Uh, but another thing that we can do, uh, we cannot yet make all those shapes, the stamp collection that I showed you, we cannot yet make those uh, in the electron microscope. We've been trying, but um, we can't vary the temperature and the concentration as a function of the time as intricately inside the electron microscope as we can in a flask that's controlled outside. So we can't quite make all of those shapes, but what we can do is take shapes that have been made in advance and make them go away uh, by etching them. So here is an example where we have an etchant, in this case an iron iron, iron three plus, that will etch a gold nanoparticle. And you can see that if we expose it to etchant, then the gold nanoparticle is slowly dissolved. So here you see some movies, uh, and in fact, Chad has done beautiful work um, with um, 
making many different shapes of noble metal nanoparticles, as have several other really wonderful people in the community. So nothing that we've invented here, but we've taken all these shapes which have been reported in the literature, and we've grown them, and then we place them inside the liquid cell, and we destroy them. <laughs> so uh, rather than growing the crystals, we're taking them apart. But as you know, uh, those two are cousins. <laughs> So if we study how we can take them apart, we'll learn a lot about how they form as well. And so here you can see all of these etching experiments, and you can see that different shapes are, are um, uh, etched and controlled in different ways. You'll see, for example, in a few movies that they etch a little ways, and then they seem to get very stable for a little while. Little tiny particles will form because atoms have been removed and you supersaturate the solution, so new crystals can form inside there. But you can also see that these shapes evolve in very, very complicated ways. Now, it turns out that we can convert this into real science. And one, the first thing that we can do is simply take these rods and make many of them and track how their dimensions change. So we can make a plot, and if we do that, what we find is that under all other conditions being fixed, the rate at which the crystals disappear is simply related to the curvature. <laughs> the more the crystal's curved, the faster it's etched. And that's easy to understand because a curved crystal has uh, broken, a curved facet has essentially broken or weaker bonds at it, so it becomes a spot that can be picked off more easily uh, by the etchant. And so uh, that's a quite a simple idea. So we can make this kind of contour plot that shows, again, how a crystal disappears. Sequentially, these are each units of time. And what you can see, of course, is that it appears as though um, uh, atoms are being lost from the curved end a lot faster than they're being lost from the flat side. So we can take this type of diagram and simply color code it. So we make what we would call a time domain contour plot. And in this contour plot, what we do is we say the color is proportional to the curvature. Um, so the hotter colors are the higher curvatures. And then the contours represent the evolution of the shape as a function of the time for crystals that are not rotating. Done. OK. So I'm not going to go through all the details then, because I'm told that I'm done. But what I'll say is that we can make these diagrams that look, for example, like this, where you see these time domain contour plots. And if you go in and you look at them in some detail, it turns out that we can actually explain um, in some molecular detail um, why all the shapes that people have seen in the literature are showing up um, in a very quantitative way that differentiates between slow and fast growth and, and, and other features like that. So the liquid cell is now moving into a stage, I think, where it's becoming extremely quantitative, and it's going to become a very powerful tool. I'm going to wrap it up there and just thank you and say that, you know, it's been a, a, a real pleasure to be here with you and to share with you a little bit of our story of how we've been developing this building block of nanoscience, the nanocrystal. And um, it's been fun to see them find their use in the real world and also now to make a cycle back into the fundamental science of these materials and to try to understand how it is that they form, how they disappear, and how we could eventually know a lot more about them. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Paul, for a very stimulated talk, stimulating talk. We can allow one question from the audience, please. Uh, we have not, um, you know, so what we have developed a lot of these probes which can be biofunctionalized and introduced inside different environments. So people have done, for colleagues and other research groups have certainly grown, um, tissue, you know, proto-looking tissues 
uh, like uh, ACE and I and things like that uh, with quantum dots present and have observed evolutions of behaviors. But to say whether, I mean, I, you know, typically the, the approach people have taken has been to think that the quantum dots are simply spectators uh, and not influencers of the, um, you know, shapes that are being formed. As to whether that's truly the case or not, which seems to be the implication of your question, uh, I actually don't know, you know, whether that's, so uh, it's an interesting question and I hadn't really thought about it, but it might be possible. And now to Professor Gil Markovich from the School of Chemistry, Tel Aviv University, and the current head of the School of Chemistry, an optically active nanostructure. Gil, please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Ori and Adi, first of all, for inviting me. It's a great honor to be here on this occasion, and congratulations to the prize winner. Uh, so I'll be telling you, uh, in continuation to Paul's talk, about a specific topic of, that has to do with nanostructures, and this is a chirality, and especially uh, uh, the fact that chiral objects can also have optical activity. And uh, the work that I'll describe to you is uh, all, the wo all work by Asaf Ben Moshe, a very talented PhD student who is here in the audience. And not only that he did this work, he also conceived these experiments. And uh, so I'm only responsible for the introduction and the conclusion. <laughs> uh, and there are several collaborators that I'll probably mention as we go on. So chirality and chiroptical activity. Chirality is a geometric property, right? It's the lack of uh, mirror symmetry and is very fundamental in chemistry, especially in biochemistry, responsible for a, lot, a major part of molecular recognition and so on. Uh, and uh, there's optical activity, the influence of uh, chiral molecules on the polarization state of light. And uh, what we deal with is actually uh, the influence of inorganic nanostructures on the polarization state of light that is optical activity of the inorganic objects. Optical activity uh, is expressed via several effects, so we may, may mainly deal with circular dichroism. I'll explain what it is in a moment. And there's also circular biofringes or, or optically, optical rotatory dispersion, as it's called by chemists. And it's uh, uh, Louis Pasteur, of course, who is the father many other researchers as well, but he, he made the major contribution to connect between chirality and optical activity, and we'll return to Louis Pasteur at the end. So uh, circular dichroism is a spectroscopy techniques that, technique that probes the difference in absorption between left-handed and right-handed uh, circularly uh, polarized light. Uh, it has contributions both from the transi electric transition dipole moment and the magnetic transition dipole moment of the uh, molecules. And uh, we often look at a factor called the symmetry factor or an isotropy factor, which is basically the ratio of this difference divided by the absorption coefficient by itself. In typical biomolecules absorbing in the ultraviolet, like proteins and DNA, this magnitude is quite small, order of 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4. So uh, this circular dichroism is a small effect usually. Uh, and we, uh, as I told you, we are interested in optical activity of inorganic objects. So we have reviewed what are the possibilities uh, uh, of getting such optical activity. So you can think about, I need a pointer, okay. So you can think about four ways uh, maybe that you can get optical activity in inorganic nanostructures. Uh, uh, the first one uh, is, uh, sorry just getting a chiral shape, of course. So this shape has to have dimensions of smaller than the wavelength of light to become you know, optically active. And uh, uh, this is uh, indeed a dream of us to be able to make by uh, chemical ways nanostructures that have this kind of lower symmetry compared with, for example, the structures that Paul have showed in the previous talk. And uh, this is uh, ongoing work by us and others to try to find chemical ways to, to make these things. Uh, lithographically, it's diffi still difficult to make such 3D structures uh, to work in the visible range of the spectrum. 
another uh, possibility is to arrange archival objects like quantum dots or even more metal particles, let's say they are spherical, but arrange them in a helical or any chiral, other chiral uh, way uh, and uh, have them close enough to be interacting so the system knows that it's chiral and will be optically active. A third way uh, is just having uh, nanostructures made of intrinsically chiral structures, that is the atoms are arranged in a chiral fashion and because of that will have optical activity. And the last part, and we have worked a lot on this, is actually having archival inorganic objects but have them interact in some way with chiral molecules and by this the chiral molecules induce optical activity on the inorganic structure. And I'm fortunate actually to connect in this talk to all three winners, and I will show you how. <laughs> so first of all, of course, our, our units that I'll describe here are quantum dots, semiconductor particles that of course were uh, pioneered by uh, Paula Libisatos. Uh, and uh, uh, on, on top of that, uh, we, we put chiral molecules like DNA, peptides, and so on, and of course, Chad Mirkin has a lot of credit for this kind of work, also by, uh, for controlling uh, shapes of inorganic nanostructures, so certainly it's very relevant. And, and last, I mean, our ambition to, to go to, to make uh, nanoscale chiral objects uh, connects to the work of uh, John Penry, of course, uh, who also predicted that by making uh, certain metallic chiral structures, you might be able to get uh, interesting metamaterials and even maybe negative uh, refractive index. So uh, let me go on and uh, deeper into our topic. So we have done in the past a lot of work about taking uh, archival metal uh, nanostructures, that is uh, noble metals like gold and silver, connecting chiral molecules. It turns out that under certain conditions, you can get optical activity in the surface plasmon resonance of the metal particle if you attach molecules. And this work has been, we've been doing that together with Sasha Govov, a theory person from Ohio University who actually developed a model to describe uh, how uh, by dipole-dipole interaction the molecules can induce circular dichroism in the plasmon resonance of the metal core. And this is sensitive to the orientation of the molecules. So if they are completely random and with random orientations around the surface, you will get nothing. And depending on the orientation, you will get different signs of the circular dichroism and so on. It's very interesting. It can tell you a lot about the orientation of the molecules at the surface uh, uh, and so on. So it's, it's, it can be a very useful uh, technique to understand how molecules interact with metal surfaces. Um, so uh, I want to go on now to quantum dots. So this is the topic of today. <coughs> so uh, quantum dots, you already saw, they have a sort of particle in a box state, right? And uh, we put molecules, in that, in that case, Asaf put uh, uh, chiral molecules. Uh, after making the quantum dots with standard uh, ligands, uh, he adds, for example, cysteine molecules, transfers the particles to water, water because cysteine is water soluble, and cysteine attaches to the surface, okay, and, then, and the molecule itself has uh, orbitals, uh, molecular uh, electronic states that may interact with the states of the quantum dot. And I will show you that actually uh, uh, the, the study of the circular dichroism developed in uh, uh, the exciton states, in this absorption states that lead to these electron hole pairs, uh, actually may be very interesting to understand how the quantum dot interacts with the molecules surrounding the quantum dot. And then again, as Paul mentioned, there's the surface in the middle between the, qu the quantum dot and the molecules, and uh, this makes life complicated, but also we may suggest this as a w an another way to look at the surface of the quantum dots. So uh, how, how could uh, the, the chiral molecules induce uh, this optical activity in the quantum dot that is by itself completely a chiral? So you can think about basically three different mechanisms. One is the one that is acting, and we have 
more or less proved that in the metal case, long-range dipole-dipole interaction between uh, the chiral molecule and the uh, inorganic core. However, since this effect is proportional to the dielectric constant of the core, in the semiconductor it's much lower than the metal, and I will, will not get into the details, but certainly this is completely negligible in the quantum dots. So there are two other options. One of them is real hybridization, mixing of the electronic states of the quantum dot, either electron or hole or both of them, with the states of the molecule. Another possibility that was suggested by other people working in this field, like Nick Kotov and Yuri Gunko, is that there is a surface distortion by the molecule, the chiral molecules that attach to the surface that will cause an asymmetry in the arrangement of the atoms at the surface. And this asymmetry will be felt by the electron or hole, and uh, this will develop the uh, circular dichroism effect. So uh, we, we need to tell whether those effect, I mean, first of all, to, to prove that two and three are possible and maybe distinguish between the two. So this is, for example, a typical result that Asaf can get now, taking a cadmium selenide quantum dots, what we call high quality ones that were synthesized using Alevisatos type methods, and uh, then transferred to water coated with cysteine. So you can remarkably see that uh, the circular dichroism spectrum of the, the quantum dot coated with cysteine is very rich. It has lots of details, more details than just the absorption spectrum. This is absorption, this is circular dichroism. And uh, this is the type of effect that we want to understand its origin, and by this maybe learn a more about the interaction of the molecules with the quantum dot. So this is a series of different sizes. Asaf made them in Dan Oron's lab in Weizmann Institute, and a series of uh, circular dichroism spectra. And uh, this is another interesting thing that Asaf, Ayelet, Dan's student, and also Asaf's wife, uh, they, they, they actually uh, noticed that if you look at the absorption spectrum, I mean, so first of all, you can, you can immediately recognize that uh, the CD spectrum looks like a derivative of, of the absorption spectrum. So actually, they were able to really uh, construct a series of, of Gaussians which represent the different absorption states of this quantum dot, these exciton states, and uh, at the same positions, take uh, derivatives of the Gaussians and really reconstruct the circular, circular dichroism spectrum from the absorption spectrum. So this is very interesting, and uh, it clearly has to do with, uh, maybe you cannot see that, that it looks like there's a spin splitting of the states. And it's very, very similar to work, old work, for example, done by Munji Bawendi on magnetic circular dichroism of quantum dots, which is just the Zeeman effect, I mean, the effect of magnetic field on the states of the quantum dot. So the interaction with the uh, chiral molecule looks like it's like an effective magnetic field acting on the uh, states of the quantum dot. And uh, uh, then we can go, actually, uh, so Asaf made different kinds of core shell particles that were also mentioned in the previous talk to try to understand, first of all, whether it's the electron or the whole states in the quantum dot that are interacting with the chiral molecules. So with core shell mo uh, uh, dots, you can actually sometimes block the electron from the surface or the hole from the surface and, and see uh, what happens. So in this case, uh, cadmium selenide coated with the cadmium sulfide shell, you basically block mostly the whole states while the electrons uh, uh, can access basically the surface. And here you see actually that as, as a stuff grows the shell, and those are very few monolayers of capping on the quantum dot, the circular dichroism signal decays. So this is the first proof that actually it's the, uh, valence, the valence band or the whole states of the quantum dot interacting with the highest occupied molecular orbital of the molecules. Asaf also did the inverse, inverse uh, case where you have a cadmium sulfide uh, core and cadmium selenide shell. And there the hole is completely localized at the shell. This is a slightly more difficult case, but what you have is that after 
building the shell, the thickness of the shell doesn't change. There's a small signal going all, all the way along uh, the building of the shell, which another, is another sort of proof that uh, it's the whole states that matter. So to, to conclude this part, this is a demonstration that this excitonic, induced excitonic CD is primarily the interaction of the whole states with the uh, highest occupied molecular uh, orbital of the molecules. So it's, I would say, a new way to look into the interaction of the molecules with the quantum dots. And uh, uh, also this interaction looks like a, a effective magnetic field that splits the uh, spin states of the electronic states of the dots. And the last part is that theoretical description is not available for this kind of systems and uh, it's really highly needed. So, so far I told you about a very tiny effect of, again, delta epsilon over epsilon order of 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, that these molecules uh, 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 induce in the quantum dots. So here comes the more even interesting part, where Asaf thought, I mean, yeah, this is a really small effect, and you know, in nanoscience, you want to find big effects, some, you know, shrinking sizes and, and uh, uh, getting, you know, spectacular things. So then I think he had a, a very, very nice idea. And I call it the nanoscale version of Pasteur's experiment. I mean, it's, all, it's very similar to the macroscopic Pasteur experiment that he did on tartaric acid, but now trying to uh, separate or, or have nanocrystals that have a, a certain handedness and uh, control the system to have maybe only one handedness and not the other. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, there are chiral crystals, there are many types of inorganic chiral uh, crystals. The most famous one maybe is quartz that is found in nature and can, there, you can find right-handed and left-handed crystals in nature. So uh, a more interesting optically uh, uh, system is, is mercury sulfide that, that was the first system that Asaf tried. It consists of helical chains. The, the crystal itself consists of heli, hel helical chains of mercury and sulfur. So you can have left-handed or right-handed cinnabar. This is a mineral you can find also in nature. And Asaf has grown this kind of uh, uh, crystals uh, in the presence of strongly binding chiral molecules like cysteine, penicillamine, and so on. And he was able to get huge, this is circular dichroism of left-handed and right-handed crystals. This is the absorption spectrum. He got huge dissymmetry factor, order of 10 to the minus 2 and above, which is way, way above other semiconductors. This is mercury sulfide. This is dissymmetry factor, other semiconductors completely off scale compared to the other systems. So it was clear that we have high optical activity due to the ability of the, of the synthesis procedure to form mostly right-handed or mostly left-handed nanocrystals. The next system was tellurium and selenium, the elements, they also have the same space group, the crystal space group, uh, helical chains in the crystal. Uh, I don't have time to go to all the details, but let's look at, it could get all kinds of shapes, again, using uh, thiolated chiral molecules like cysteine and so on. So uh, one of them that we suspected as be having chiral shape was indeed confirmed to have chiral shape by electron tomography in a TEM. So uh, they have a twisted shape uh, that gives them very strong optical activity. Again, don't have time to go to, into all details, but those tiny uh, elongated nanocrystals actually ha act as chiral optical resonators. And, and the resonance frequency changes just with the length of those objects. The, the last spectacular thing is that Asaf was able to convert them to uh, gold shapes just by adding gold salt. And there's a spontaneous uh, precipitation of gold on top of the structure, the solution of the tellurium. And then uh, you get also huge optical activity. Again, order of dissymmetry factor 10 to the minus 2 in the, uh, in the longitudinal plasma resonance of those nanorods. So to conclude this talk, I have shown, I think, that uh, this niche of uh, chirality in nanostructures is a very challenging and interesting uh, aspect of, of nanoscience that uh, 
is worth further exploration. Thank you very much for your attention. No, no, certainly not. I mean, uh, uh, no, I can, I can, you know, intuitively I can understand why you ask this. Um, no, we haven't. I mean, it's so far down the road. I mean, first of all, you want to make really more chiral, you know, more twisted shapes, and that by itself will be a big chemical challenge. I am interested yeah, in sure. No, I actually, I think the optical applications like metamaterials are more, more, you know, straightforward and, and you know. <laughs> well, it's a matter of taste, I guess, and, and what you think might, might be doable. You know, this by itself is already a big, big task. <laughs> sure. That, that's a very good question that we want to learn. I mean, first of all, for example, in these tellurium structures, we think that they are formed by kind of oriented attachment of small units, and certainly the, how they pack, the molecules pack at the surface is, is very, very important. Uh, no, I mean, we haven't done that, but this is definitely the next thing to, to understand. soon will be changed. And uh, Tal will tell us about karyotic uh, tissue regeneration from matrix design to bionic art engineering. Oh, thank you very much, Ori and uh, Adi, uh, for inviting me to this uh, uh, symposium. It's a great honor for me. Um, the talk is going to be less nanoscience, more nanotechnology. Um, and the lab is uh, working on uh, building different types of uh, tissues. Uh, we're working on spinal cords, brain, uh, ovaries, bone marrow, but I will mainly focus today on uh, uh, building the heart uh, for cardiac regeneration. So before uh, starting to tell you about the technologies that uh, we can offer, I'll say a few words about the disease that uh, uh, we're trying to cure. So uh, first of all, heart diseases are still the number one cause of death in the Western world. Uh, actually, one out of uh, three deaths in uh, the United States is uh, from uh, heart disease. And myocardial infarction or heart attack captures a, a significant fracture of these diseases. And it happens when a major blood vessel that nourishes the left ventricle is blocked. As a consequence, blood, oxygen, nutrients are uh, deprived from the uh, ventricle, the cardiomyocytes, cardiac muscle cells are very sensitive. Uh, they simply die when they don't get oxygen. And since these cells are uh, special, they cannot proliferate, they cannot divide. And since we do not have enough stem cells in the heart, this whole area becomes fibrotic, becomes a scar tissue, cannot contract, cannot send pulses of blood to the rest of the body. And the poor statistic says that 50% of the people who've had a severe heart attack will die within five years. Currently, the only solution for the end-stage patients is uh, uh, heart transplantation. And since we all know that there is a shortage in uh, donors, there's a need to uh, try to repopulate this area with cells that are capable of contraction. So the lab is uh, working on uh, different uh, uh, technologies, and I will mainly uh, uh, focus on uh, tissue engineering. 
So what is the concept of the, this approach? We can take cells from the uh, patient or from other sources. Uh, we cultivate them in a, a two-dimensional flask and then we need to create a tissue from uh, these cells and in the body when we talk about tissues, it's not just uh, uh, cells, it's the cells and the extracellular matrix. And uh, uh, this matrix is the glue of the cells. Uh, so we see the cells in uh, three-dimensional biomaterials that we develop in the lab. This should mimic the natural uh, uh, matrix. Uh, we can uh, add growth factors, small molecules, nanoparticles, and essentially we're doing everything we can to allow the cells to assemble into a functioning tissue that we can later on take and transplant uh, back to the patient. So how do we create the uh, uh, cardiac patch? We can use different uh, uh, types of cells, either adult cells from biopsies or different types of stem cells. Currently the lab is uh, shifting towards uh, uh, working with uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. These are cells that can be uh, taken from the patient uh, skin, for example, reprogrammed to become stem cells, and then differentiated to become uh, cardiomyocytes, neuron, whatever we want to work with. Um, then we take these cells and see them in the three-dimensional biomaterials. And we've already shown that if we take these uh, patches and transplant them on the infarcted heart, we can uh, significantly improve uh, heart function. However, there are different uh, uh, challenges and more challenges that we should address. And one of them is how to really create the natural uh, matrix or something that really mimics the natural uh, matrix. And for that, what we've done, we took uh, uh, pig's hearts uh, and we uh, decellularized these uh, uh, hearts, meaning we removed all the cells while keeping the matrix and then looking at the uh, matrix under an uh, electron microscope and, and seeing that uh, actually we have one big mess of uh, fibers. We have nanofibers, we have microfibers, we have aligned fibers, randomly or oriented fibers. And initially we wanted to evaluate what's the role of, the, uh, of these fibers, of these fiber populations. So synthetically uh, we created these uh, fibers, the micro, the nano, the randomly oriented or the uh, uh, aligned fibers, and we seeded cardiac cells to evaluate uh, uh, what's going on, what's, how they assemble into a functioning tissue. And this is one example, and uh, I wish we could uh, turn off uh, this slide here. Uh, and you could see, if we would do that, you could see that uh, the cells are aligning on these uh, aligned fibers, and on the randomly oriented fibers, they are uh, just positioning in a, a big mass. And this is very important because when we're talking about uh, uh, hearts, we want uh, uh, to have a nice and isotropic uh, uh, conduction. We want the cells to start uh, the electrical signal in one point and transfer it to a different point and not just, you know, uh, something that will beat uh, asynchronously. Uh, another uh, effect uh, that we studied is the effect of uh, fiber diameter. We uh, uh, synthesize these, uh, uh, thank you, these uh, nanofibers, micro or even larger uh, uh, fibers. And initially we thought that the cells will uh, prefer to grow on the nanofibers because uh, this is how they grow uh, in the uh, natural microenvironment. However, when we grew the cells, uh, uh, we could see that they uh, uh, haven't developed on the nanofibers and they really like the uh, uh, bigger uh, fibers. And eventually when we take everything into uh, uh, account, we can create a cardiac patch that contracts nicely in the lab. This is a few centimeters in diameter, few millimeters in uh, thickness, and it contracts nicely uh, in the lab for a long period of time without external stimulation. However, when we uh, take these cardiac patches and transplant them, since we uh, made the, the matrices from uh, uh, synthetic materials, they will provoke immune response in the body and we'll have nice results after a month showing a nice uh, uh, regeneration. Uh, and after two months, these uh, cardiac patches will be uh, uh, rejected. So the next thing that we've done was to uh, develop the, another technology that relies on the patient's own uh, materials and the patient's own cells so we could uh, take uh, fatty tissue from the patient just by a simple uh, uh, three-minute uh, procedure, uh, take the cells, reprogram them to become uh, uh, cardiac cells, 
take their material and build the uh, uh, scaffolds from them, and then we have an autologous uh, uh, patch. It looks like this. These are the uh, nanofibers that uh, uh, we get, and the cells really like these uh, uh, fibers. They are elongated and aligned. And uh, we can take these cardiac patches and transplant them. Um, however, uh, they will not provoke uh, immune response. However, they will simply die because there are no blood vessels within these cardiac patches. And this is the uh, uh, next uh, uh, project. Uh, uh, it was to create blood vessel networks inside these cardiac patches um, to uh, be able to bring oxygen into the cardiac cells to maintain their uh, uh, viability. So this is one story. Another story that I will, uh, and we'll come back to this story uh, in a minute. Another story is the uh, transfer of the electrical uh, signal within the cardiac patches. So this is a typical uh, a sponge for uh, uh, growing cardiac cells. So the cells are organizing in these uh, pores, as you can see here. And these cells contract and these cells uh, contract, but they're not really speaking with each other on the electrical level. Um, and we thought that if we could synthesize gold nanowires and embed them inside the biomaterial, the cells will start to uh, communicate uh, uh, through these uh, uh, gold nanowires. And I will not go uh, into the details. I'll just show you uh, uh, two movies without gold nanowires and with gold nanowires. We stimulated this area and we wanted to see the propagation of the electrical uh, signal. Uh, so this is what happens without the gold. There's illumination here and there. This is calcium imaging within the cardiac patch. Nothing is really beating synchronously, but when we uh, stimulate uh, uh, the uh, nanowire, the cardiac patch, and not here, somewhere over here, really far away, we can see that uh, through these uh, gold nanowires, we're able to uh, uh, get a nice contraction throughout the uh, cardiac patch. So we... Uh, even optimize this uh, uh, process when we have, uh, this is one fiber with the tiny gold uh, uh, nanoparticles and we could see that between 10 to 40 nanometers we got the best uh, uh, contraction. And remember we had the uh, autologous uh, cardiac patch, the autologous uh, material from the patient. We thought maybe we can uh, even uh, uh, take this uh, uh, material and decorate it with the uh, gold nanoparticles. Here you can see without uh, uh, particles, four nanometers or 10 nanometers uh, uh, particles. You can see uh, uh, the islands of the gold. You can see them uh, here. And the most important uh, uh, thing in this uh, slide is this graph showing that we can take a completely biological uh, material from the patient uh, with all the biological motifs uh, within and create a conducting, a fully conducting uh, material that uh, uh, will transfer the electrical uh, signal. And when we culture the cardiac cells uh, uh, within, in every parameter, every functional parameter, such as the contraction uh, uh, force or the excitation threshold or the velocity of the uh, uh, signal uh, transfer, uh, we could see that the cardiac patches with the nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles, were uh, superiors. Um, we took it to the, uh, uh, to the rats, we induced uh, heart attacks, and of course we uh, 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 transplanted the cardiac patches on these uh, uh, infarcted hearts. And we could see uh, pretty uh, soon that there is a nice integration on the electrical level between the healthy part of the heart and the cardiac uh, uh, patch. So here you can see that we uh, uh, were transplanting the cardiac patches, you can see the sutures. And we thought maybe we can develop a different technology that, that doesn't need even to, uh, we don't even need to uh, uh, transplant the patches. Maybe we can inject the patches. And uh, we created this uh, technology that we took the patient's uh, own material and we milled it to small uh, pieces. Uh, we found uh, uh, the right recipe to make it liquid in uh, room temperature. Now we can um, uh, mix it with the cells. And uh, in uh, 37 degrees, this, uh, uh, this becomes a hydrogel, it solidifies, so basically we can take it injected via catheter directly to the heart without uh, the need to uh, uh, open the, uh, the chest. So these are just uh, uh, some mechanical properties and uh, stability and the nanofibers in, the, uh, in this uh, hydrogel. 
Um, so we took, I, I told you that we can, that we took the material from the patient and I told you that we took some fatty uh, uh, tissue cells from the patient and we reprogrammed these cells to become uh, uh, cardiomyocytes as you can see here in the dish. They really contract uh, nicely. They have uh, all the uh, uh, protein expressions of cardiomyocytes, adult cardiomyocytes uh, such as uh, troponin or uh, actinin. And eventually, we could uh, uh, create a cardiac patch from the patient's own material and the patient's own cells that will not provoke an, an immune response, and it contracts nicely in the lab for a long period of time. And actually, we're currently uh, in the middle of uh, 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 PIGS experiments. This is uh, an essential step before going to clinical trials, so we're injecting this, uh, sorry, uh, these materials with the patient's own uh, uh, cells. Uh, now it's in uh, pigs. Another thing that uh, we can do with uh, uh, the hydrogel, this uh, special hydrogel, is to uh, 3D uh, print it. So what we want to do, this, uh, we have a great printer in the lab, what we want to do is to create blood vessels, uh, as you can see here, within the cardiac patch. So we seed cardiomyocytes in the, uh, uh, in the patch and uh, endothelial cells that will build blood vessels. Uh, and then uh, uh, we can take these uh, um, patches with the blood vessel, uh, lift them up, and uh, even uh, uh, transfer liquid uh, through these uh, cardiac patches. And I remind you, these are uh, patient-specific printed cardiac uh, uh, patches. Other things that we can do with these uh, uh, materials is uh, uh, create nanoparticles to deliver uh, growth factors, or uh, uh, by using, oops, by using uh, microfluidic uh, uh, systems, create droplets, then collect these uh, droplets. These droplets are with the uh, cells. We can collect them, uh, and you can see the cells inside these uh, uh, droplets, and then we can inject them uh, to the uh, organ that we want, either the liver, the uh, brain, uh, the heart, and uh, um, many other organs. The last project that uh, I will speak about is uh, um, what we call cyborg tissues, and this is the integration of uh, uh, nanoelectronics with engineered tissues. And not just because it's really cool to, to integrate uh, electronics with uh, living uh, um, uh, cells, because there's a necessity. We wanted to be able to evaluate the, uh, uh, um, the, the, the viability or the contraction of the cardiac cells uh, online. So we created uh, thin films of uh, uh, nanoelectronics with uh, many field effect transistors uh, uh, here. We incorporated them with the uh, uh, three-dimensional biomaterial to create a three-dimensional uh, scaffold with uh, um, tiny sensors within. And once we cultured uh, uh, cardiac cells, we could immediately uh, see the function on our uh, computer. Uh, we could add drugs and see immediately how the drug uh, affects the uh, cardiac cells. But it was not enough for us at this point. It was a great publication and we, we really liked this uh, project, but it wasn't enough because, okay, we could see that uh, the cells are uh, uh, contracting or not. We could see if they're synchronized or not. But if they're not, we couldn't do anything about it. So the next thing that uh, uh, we decided to do was to uh, create a um, new type of electronics that, in addition to the sensing, will be able to uh, stimulate, provide electrical stimulation to the, uh, uh, to the cultured uh, cells, to the tissue, or to release drugs just by typing on the computer. So if you think about it, the, the uh, patient is sitting in his house, is not feeling well, there's something wrong, uh, wrong with the patient's heart, immediately the physician can log onto the computer uh, see the uh, condition of the heart and start releasing drugs or uh, provide electrical stimulation. So this is the recording. There's nothing new about uh, uh, this. However, I'll show you now uh, three movies. I'll go fast because I see that Ori is uh, becoming impatient. Um, so this is the, uh, uh, the contraction of the uh, tissue, normal contraction. And now I'll show you what's going on when we decide that we want to interfere and uh, uh, just type on the computer and we can paste the tissue from afar, one hertz or uh, two hertz as you can see here, and this is just quantification. 
and we can also control the signal propagation. So we have a tissue that contracts from here over here. We can uh, do something like ju that, just reverse the, uh, the signal. This is uh, uh, the heat maps of uh, that. And the last slide that uh, I'm going to show is how we can control the release of uh, factors. We can either release uh, positive, uh, uh, positively charged uh, molecules such as uh, proteins. Uh, in this case, it was SDF1, a molecule that recruits stem cells uh, into the patch. This is uh, what we could see. Or we could uh, uh, um, um, develop a, a different electroactive protein that will release a negatively charged small molecule uh, such as dexamethasone, an anti-inflammatory drug, and then uh, uh, we could see that we were able uh, to attenuate the uh, function of uh, macrophages, uh, immune cells that actually they uh, approach the, uh, the patch to uh, reject it. And uh, this is uh, uh, the group, my lab, uh, lab members, and the funding. Thank you and sorry if I uh, uh, took more time. Thank you, Tal, for bringing so much hope to one third of us. <laughs> of, uh, of Americans. One third of Americans. <laughs> How about in Israel? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Um, two brief questions, please. So you're talking about the scar tissue that is formed after yes. the uh, infarction. So the scar tissue becomes uh, fibrotic. It's actually, it's just uh, collagen and it becomes a, a really thin uh, layer of collagen. Um, well, uh, if we connect the tissue, uh, the, the engineered tissue to the healthy part of the heart, just make a, a gap or, or just uh, uh, put it, uh, um, without uh, really uh, creating uh, um, some kind of gap between the healthy part and the uh, engineered tissue. So we're okay, the, the uh, scar tissue degrades, continues to degrade and uh, will eventually uh, disappear. So there's no problem with that. Um, can you use these methods to fuse nervous cells? I mean, um, it's it's been for a long time. The, the problem is once a nerve cell is cut. It, so this, this is anymore. exactly what we're doing now with the uh, uh, spinal cord injuries. Uh, we, we're taking uh, uh, these uh, cells from the patient. We're uh, uh, reprogramming them to become uh, neurons or uh, stem cells and then differentiating them to become neurons, motor neurons, and we're creating uh, patches for a uh, spinal cord injury. So this is something that is done now in the lab. Okay. Well, thank you. More questions? Uh, if not, thank you, Tal, again. Theoretical physicist, uh, nevertheless, I've been given the honor to introduce these uh, wonderful chemists and life scientists. Um, I guess my relation to the nanocenter is that I study uh, the theory of nanomechanical systems. Uh, but uh, nothing about that. Our first speaker is Chad Merkin. Uh, he is one of the three laureates of the Dan uh, David Prize this year. Um, I won't say anything about him except the fact that this is already his second prize that he's receiving here at Tel Aviv University. In 2003, if I'm not mistaken, he uh, received the Sackler Prize here, uh, which we believe is a great predictor for uh, even better and bigger prizes in the future. And this is a proof of that, and we think that this is not the end of the line. So uh, we hope that uh, this is just the beginning of even more prizes. So without further ado, I think you've heard a lot about the laureates. Uh, please, Chad. Uh, 
podium is yours. Ah, and now we're fine. Fantastic. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, it's it's really a, a great honor to, to be here. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, the Dan David Foundation, the family, uh, and Tel Aviv University for this incredible honor. Uh, I was here 13 years ago uh, for the Sackler Prize, uh, and it was a fantastic visit, and I made a lot of friends that remain my friends today, uh, and I see them all over the world, including Israel, and it's always exciting to come back and see all the incredible progress that's going on here. Um, Yossi Klafter, I guess he wasn't president back then. He was maybe chairman of the department. Uh, it was kind of, he's a very prophetic man because um, uh, at the time um, when I came for the Sackler Prize, um, he was all caught up in, I guess, the excitement of the Dan David Prize. And around me, he was talking about this incredible million dollar prize that was going to be given out and draw an incredible spotlight on, on science. And then he kind of looked at me and he thought, oh, God, this isn't very good. I'm kind of comparing the two, and he said, oh, but maybe you can come back in a few years. <laughs> so I, I like the way he thinks. Um, in, any way, in any event, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the things we're doing with uh, what I like to refer to as spherical nucleic acids um, and this concept of, of programmable assembly. And, and Paul's talk really uh, set the stage for much of what I'm going to talk about. I mean, he talked about moving atoms around and trying to figure out how to make perfect nanocrystals. We're thinking about building materials in, in a very different way. We also think about nanoscience very differently. Yossi said, well, this is really just chemistry. I think it's actually more than chemistry. Uh, it, it's, it's a way of thinking about science in a, in a, in a different way, uh, a recognition of the fact that structures on this length scale are bigger than the conventional molecular systems that most chemists work with, uh, yet smaller than, than the bulk materials that we often rely on for many of the technological applications that we use. Um, and it's an understanding that when you work on this length scale and when you can arrange matter on this length scale that you can begin to realize properties uh, that lead to new technologies that I think is really quite important. And that's really kind of the story of my whole career and, and my entry into this particular area and some of the things that we've discovered over the last couple of decades. So in the spirit of the past, present, and future, let's take a step back to the past. Um, I was talking to some of the students yesterday, I think John brought this up, that this, this was really an important discovery. I think there's nobody in this room that would argue that. When Watson and Crick, along with Rosalind Franklin, figured out uh, the structure of DNA and reported it to the world, it really changed the way we thought about many different things. For the first time, we understood the structure of the blueprint of life. But if you think about it, that understanding led to so many other advances right, in terms of how cells function, for example. So many new technologies, forensic applications, medical diagnostic tools, a whole new wave of therapeutics are coming online because of an understanding of this particular structure. Without it, we wouldn't be able to do it. And so this was you know, really a critical advance, and it's something that also led to a lot of the ways that we think about many of the scientific problems that we address at Northwestern. Now, again, if we go back, and this is the Sackler days, the Sackler Prize days, um, we uh, got famous early on for thinking about uh, building a, a new form of nucleic acid. Uh, our idea back in the mid-90s was that you could begin to think about DNA not as a biological construct, but as a chemical or materials construct. And you could think about developing chemistry that would allow you to take short strands of DNA and interface it with many of the beautiful particle type structures that Paul showed. Why would you want to do that? Well, the idea was very simple. We could begin to think of particles as atoms, and we could think of oligonucleotides as programmable bonds. And we could then begin to develop a new type of chemistry where you could build materials from the bottom up and force the assembly of beautiful, highly crystalline architectures where you could control all the different parameters of those structures through the choice of particle building blocks and oligonucleotide building blocks. And so that kind of set us on uh, uh, an odyssey uh, to begin to look at the, the properties of these structures, to look at how we could make different types of structures. And we discovered a lot of things along the way. And one of the things we discovered was, first of all, when we make these architectures, it's not one strand of DNA per particle, it's many strands. And that's why I use the term spherical nucleic acid. Under the right conditions, you can create structures that in cartoon fashion look like this on the left. You can see the electron microscopy images on the upper right, where you have a particle core in this case a gold particle, 
surrounded by a shell of DNA or RNA or any specialty nucleic acid that you'd like. And that's a highly programmable construct. And we began to kind of develop that from a material standpoint. We also began to look at how these types of structures interacted with biological systems. And what we discovered was not only was this an incredible materials construct in terms of building new materials, but it constituted a completely new form of what I would like to think of as the most important molecule ever discovered by scientists, ever synthesized by chemists. There is no natural version of a spherical nucleic acid. This is only made through concepts from chemistry and nanoscience, yet these types of structures on a sequence for sequence basis do things completely different from their linear cousins. Why do I say that? Um, we'll look at this slide here. This is uh, a, a uh, table that uh, I took from a review article, a perspective article that I wrote about three years ago where we coined the term spherical nucleic acid. It's kind of neat. At that time, in 2012, it was one of the few terms you could go to Google, type in spherical nucleic acid, and get zero hits. Like it's, that's hard to do. <laughs> And that tells you that people really didn't think about this. What? Uh, uh, about uh, a couple million right now. Because oh, it, it, this kind of changed the way you thought about this, this architecture. And, and I'll, show, I'll show you why it's so important in a second. Um, so, so again, because there's no natural version of this type of architecture. And there wasn't a recognition of the fact that these, this arrangement of nucleic acids was important. But it is. Uh, you look at it in almost every category. Uh, if we look at the ability to bind, right, a complementary nucleic acid. Remember, DNA, there are two strands that come together to form the double helix. If I take a spherical nucleic acid and bind it to a complementary nucleic acid, it binds about 100 times more tightly than a linear nucleic acid. Why is it? That's not just phenomenological. It turns out when you tack oligonucleotides down into this spherical architecture on a surface and preorient them, you wipe out a lot of the entropic penalty associated with hybridization or forming the duplex. And for that, for that reason, spherical nucleic acids on a sequence or sequence basis will always bind complementary nucleic acids more tightly. That's a powerful concept. What that means is you can begin to create probes, for example, that soak up lower concentrations of target than the same sequence with, for example, a molecular fluorophore probe with a single-stranded type of architecture. If I look at the subsequent melting properties, Normal DNA melts over a very broad temperature range. These types of structures melt over a very narrow temperature range. You can get them down to a single degree. Why is that important? Well, I can use that to create high selectivity probes so that I get not only high sensitivity, but also high selectivity or the ability to discriminate between different types of targets. This guy must have a core. And it doesn't have to be gold. As I'm going to show you, it can be almost any material you'd like. And that allows you to tailor all the physical and chemical properties, the plasmonic, the catalytic, the magnetic, the luminescent properties of such structures. But this is what really made me a believer that we were on to something pretty spectacular, at least from a, a structure function standpoint, from a biology standpoint. Um, most people are taught, if they take general chemistry or biochemistry or biology, that nucleic acids will not naturally enter cells. I'm talking about human cells, for example, mammalian cells. Uh, why is that? Well, the cell wall is negatively charged, and DNA is negatively charged. So it kind of makes sense. And it also makes sense from, a, from a, a, a life standpoint. You don't want a lot of foreign nucleic acids moving in and out of your, your cells. That could cause a lot of problems. And it turns out that that's, in fact, true. You can do the experiment. I'll show you in a second. But spherical nucleic acids not only go in, they actively go in. And, in fact, they go in to a very large extent. And you can see that right here. So if I look at epithelial cells in this case, shown up in the upper panel, I take a linear nucleic acid with a fluorophore, a signaling agent. It gives off a red signal in this case. You can see there's no appreciable uptake. You take that exact same sequence and you arrange it into a spherical nucleic acid form. As I said, not only does it go in, it goes in better than anything known to man. And we know why that is. We've studied that now over the last decade. Uh, it turns out there are things called scavenger receptors on the surfaces of many cells. So this is actually common to many cell types that can recognize the three-dimensional architecture that defines a spherical nucleic acid, localize it on the cell wall, and take the structure in via a process called caviolin mediated endocytosis. Linear nucleic acids are not recognized. So that's kind of neat. We're in hijacking nature's natural machinery in this case to effectively get cells to take in large amounts of, of a nucleic acid type of architecture. 
Why is that important? Well, that enables applications. And, and so this kind of actually took us down a side path away from that concept of materials design to the development of new types of biological applications. There are detection systems that take advantage of the probe characteristics that I referred to. In fact, a company called Nanosphere that was just sold to Luminex has 10 FDA cleared assays and they're growing big panel assays that allow you to basically look at different genetic signatures associated with disease. Big application is looking at sepsis. You want rapid, uh, uh, high accuracy detection at the point of use and you'd like to be able to discriminate between the different bugs that a particular patient's infected with. Why? The doctor needs information rapidly and needs to know what they're infected with to figure out what antibiotic to prescribe. These are really neat structures. There are you know, 1,800 different commercial products now. 1,600 come from this particular class of spherical nucleic acid. These are things we call nano flares. These are structures that <coughs> are very similar to what I described, except they have a short oligonucleotide, a short strand of DNA with a fluorophore hybridized to the particle surface. And that's designed that way because the gold is a great quencher. It turns off fluorescence. So this is spectroscopically silent. These structures can be fed to cells, as I just showed you. They'll go into cells. And if there's a particular RNA present that is recognized by a strand that we've you know, designed it to recognize, it binds and releases the flare and turns on fluorescence. Why is that important? That turns out to be the only known way to measure the genetic content of live cells. So now you can put this on a flow cytometer. For example, I can feed a, a, a blood sample with different nano flares and I can look for different cancer markers. And I can look for the needle in the haystack. I can sort the different rare cells in the circulating tumor cells, for example, based upon the fact that they overexpress a particular gene. And so this is a, a, not only an incredible uh, 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 type of structure in terms of understanding new science and studying living systems, but it leads to new ways of diagnosing disease. It leads to new ways of treating disease because the cells can be collected then in live form. And so one of the things you'd like to know is if I have a patient population, why do 70% of the patients respond to a particular drug cocktail and 30% don't? Well, I can take those cells in this particular case and begin to, again, use personalized medicine to begin to study why that is in fact the case because I collect those particular cells in live form. And there are lots of other things you can do with this as well. And then this is a really exciting one from a, from a medical standpoint. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this today. Uh, it's another talk. Uh, but these structures, this ability to move large amounts of nucleic acids into cells are being taken advantage of in terms of developing new therapeutic agents. Therapeutic agents that can be used to regulate gene expression. You can take these and create topical creams that will go into skin so that you can begin to flip genetic switches that allow you to correct problems associated with psoriasis, melanoma, atopic dermatitis the colon, eyes, brain, lots of different types of applications because of this rapid cellular uptake. You can even use them to begin to create very powerful immunomodulatory agents that train a, a patient's immune system to fight disease in a very specific manner. The reason you can do that is the nucleic acids can be made very selective for triggering different toll-like receptors that either ratchet up or suppress the immune system in a very selective manner. As I said, big bets are being made. These, are gone, these have gone into clinical trials now. They're actually in Europe and in, in, in Germany. And many, many drugs are going to be developed based upon this concept. And what I like about it is it comes from an understanding of, again, these structure function relation, relationships and what makes nanomaterials, in this case, new arrangements of nucleic acids unique. OK, I like to show that because that gives me a license then to talk about things that have no technological value which I'm still very interested in. And that is really the original dream. Uh, the idea that we had back in 96, and, and Paul's group was thinking along this line as well. They were taking a, a different tact in the sense they were taking the particles with a single strand of DNA and trying to create, as he referred to, molecular systems. We wanted to build arrays, and we wanted to be able to develop this concept of uh, uh, thinking about a particle as an atom and an oligonucleotide as a programmable bond, and think about building matter from the bottom up. Uh, and we didn't want to be, or at least our view was, we wouldn't, with this type of approach, be constrained by what nature constrains us with. Of course, we can do a lot of things with conventional chemistry. Here's our table of elements, our building blocks, and depending upon how we arrange them, we get different materials with different properties and different functions. Now, to think about this, you have to think about scale. Um, so if we go from an atom to a nanoparticle, um, we're really increasing the size of these building blocks. And so from my standpoint, we had to think about molecules as linkers 
that would follow that analogy and would be uh, uh, comparably large. Uh, and that limits really the, the pool of, of candidates, comp comparably large and molecularly pure. Uh, in addition, you wanted to have interaction pairs that you could program that gave you a lot of flexibility. So to me, that really left peptides or oligonucleotides. And so we centered on oligonucleotides because the idea was that if you packed them into this very dense form, you could get directionality, and that rigidity would allow you then to program interactions and, and bonding interactions in such a way that you could realize functional materials. So this is the idea in cartoon fashion. We wanted to learn how to take any set of building blocks. Paul's shown some spectacular ones that, that have been made. Many groups around the world have now developed ways of making different types of particles, controlling size, shape, and composition. And then we'd like to be able to assemble them into these beautiful structures in cartoon fashion shown here, where we can control the crystal symmetry, the lattice parameters, the distance between the particles, the orientation if they're non-spherical particles, right? And then even the crystal habit. You know, think about it. As chemists, we can't do that. I'm going to show you you actually can in this particular field. Okay, so, so if a, a chemist makes a new molecule, nobody can tell you what crystal it'll form until they actually do it. Because there are too many interactions to model. It's too, it's, it's, it's too difficult. Not in this particular case, as you're going to see. You can even control dimensionality. You can begin to build three-dimensional architectures like this or one-dimensional systems like this. That turns out to be very important in the field of plasmonics, as you'll hear, I think, uh, in, in John Pendry's talk as well. Okay, so now we go back again. This was where we were when I came for the Sackler Prize. It, it, you know, I was very proud of this back then, I, and we actually published this in Nature. I look at it now, I go, oh my God, how did we even get this thing in Nature? This is crazy. But we got it in there because it was conceptually really important, and we'd actually proven the concept to a degree. The idea, as I said, was to take particles, functionalize them with DNA, use linker molecules, and assemble them into three-dimensional networks where we could control at least periodicity. And we did that, and we knew we did that because if we took these systems and we heated them, they would melt exactly at the melting temperature of the duplex uh, interconnects holding them together. And it was a highly reversible process, and you could watch the raveling and unraveling of the DNA based upon the plasmonic properties of the particles. That actually led us down the path of developing new types of diagnostic tools. And then these were the not-so-impressive structures that we had generated. In fact, looking back at this, is, these are actually not the connected structures in, under the electron beam. These are the, the particles that are left behind after the, 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 they, they dehybridize. But they give you at least a snapshot of, of, of what you had, which was kind of an amorphous aggregate of, of, of particles. Well, today, we make these types of structures. Uh, and we've learned how to do this because we spent a lot of time studying what's important in this particular area. Uh, and it really builds off some of the themes that Paul introduced, this idea of, of kinetic versus thermodynamic control. We were snuck, stuck in kinetic traps, as I'm going to show you, in, in, in the 90s. We would used long linkers, and, and so the system had not equilibrated and come to the final thermodynamic product. This is a BCC crystal structure. It's a rhombic dodecahedron. You will always get this particular structure, because this is what's called the Wolf construction. It is the thermodynamic sink. And so what we've been asking is how do we take this incredible number of building blocks that the, the whole field is developing, and how do we put them all together to create our new table of elements and begin to build materials from the bottom up where we can control all of the architectural parameters that I alluded to, and in the process, realize architectures that have new properties that will hopefully lead, like in the case of the native particles themselves, to new technologies, and I'm confident they will. And so that's why I think from a very fundamental standpoint, this is a, a field worth uh, very aggressively pursuing. So what's important here? Well, the particle's really important, and so as I said, lots of people, including our own group, are spending time trying to make more and more perfect particles, because that, those are your atomic building blocks. The, 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 great, the greater number of imperfections, the more difficult time you have in terms of getting crystallinity, and we'll, we'll look at that in, in, in detail in a little bit. But the bond's important, and, and you can see here we have an oligonucleotide, in this case a duplex connection, with a sticky end here. That's a single strand there. That's our recognition element. Those bases program what the particles recognize. And you can see this is really quite short compared to the rest of the structure. That was actually one of the important insights we made in the uh, 2000s. Uh, you need a system that is strong enough in terms of holding the particles together, but weak enough that you get fast on-off rates and can equilibrate and fall into these thermodynamic sinks. Um, you need a rigid structure, but you also need some flexibility built into these systems. And so you can see there are breakpoints here. We have an anchoring strand, which allows us to attach it to a particle. The chemistry is different depending upon the particle you're going to use. Then you have a linker strand. That allows you to control the bond length. 
right? So, so we can dial in the, the length of the bond as well as the recognition properties that we'd like for a given system. And so if you think about this, you know, we can begin to force interaction pairs. So we can take two different particles, two different green colors in this case, and force them to assemble based upon the base pairing interactions that we all know are associated with DNA. And any really high school student can tell you the different sequences that are important in terms of recognizing others, right? ATGC. Um, so um, if you think about this, and, and I want you to think about it because it's, it's really a new type of chemistry. It, that is similar to some of the things that we do, but very different in other regards. Uh, this is interesting because we can independently control the bond from the atom. And you can't do that with conventional chemistry. We're stuck with what nature gives us with the elements that we have in the periodic table. So with the particle, I can independently control size, composition, and shape. And with the bond, I can control sequence, length, and density, the number of, of, of interaction pairs that can take place, for example. Okay, so, so how do I think about this? Well, it turns out we began to create models because we don't, we don't want to just make spectacular structures. We want to create design rules that allow you to build structures on demand. And we came up with what we call the complementary contact model. And the way to think about this is this is a geometric model uh, where the, the governing concept is that uh, enthalpy changes, hybridization is the most important thing in this particular process. It ignores entropy. And it turns out you can do that for greater than 90% of the systems that we're looking at. And what it effectively says is that the most stable structure will maximize the number of duplex DNA connections between particles. And so now you can begin to play games. And you can say, well, if that's true, I can test that. Because if I wanted to form an FCC lattice, right, I'd have to create a structure where every particle could interact with neighboring particles, 12 nearest neighbors. And I can do that by creating a particle that's self-complementary to itself. So if I terminate that with GCGC, if I flip that around, that's CGCG. So all those particles can interact with one another and in principle, if this is correct, should fall into the FCC structure. If I want a BCC structure, I don't want self-complementary particles. I want two particles that recognize one another and come together. And that's a structure that has eight nearest neighbors. That's the most efficient way of packing these types of architectures. And now if I want more exotic structures, I can change the sizes and shapes of these and how they fit together in a geometric fashion. And I can look at either computationally or on paper which arrangements maximize the contacts that will lead to duplex formation. And so if I make particles smaller, I might, might from an ALB2 lattice, for example, where I have one big and two small particles within a given crystal structure unit cell. Well, we've used this now, and I'm going to bring you up to speed so you can see where we are, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the future as well, to make lots of different types of structures. So here's an FCC lattice, a BCC lattice. Uh, cesium chloride is very similar to BCC, uh, except you might, for example, change the particle size or identity in this case, but the design rules are quite similar in that regard. Here's ALB2, right? That's the one big and two small. You're looking at electron microscopy images on the right. These are small angle scattering patterns on the left taken at the synchrotron. That's how we characterize these structures. On the right, we're always looking at these structures after they've been encased in silica, because when you dry out these structures, the DNA compresses unless you've locked them out in glass. So you're kind of looking at them frozen in silica. Here's chromium silicide. That's three small and one big. Here's cesium 6C60. That's one big and six small. So we're just playing with the, the size ratios in this case. And again, geometrically what's favored. And then sodium chloride and simple cubic here. Okay, when you start thinking about this, both from a spherical nucleic acid concept and also as what I'd call a programmable atom equivalent, it creates a, a, a blueprint for making a new table of elements. Right, as I said, defined by size, shape, and composition. And we've begun to do, do that. And you're gonna see examples I've already talked about with respect to gold. Quantum dots, which you heard from Paul, cadmium selenide, palladium, iron oxide, silica type structures. You can even cross-link these oligonucleotides and dissolve the gold core to create a hollow version of a spherical nucleic acid. This is the first true spherical nucleic acid. Things called MOFs, metal organic frameworks, uh, which really give you almost an infinite number of compositions can be turned into spherical nucleic acids or programmable atom equivalents. And you can have organic structures. These are actually important on the, on the drug development side of things. So most of the drugs that are being developed are not gold-based systems. They have a, a, an organic core, a benign core, but that display of oligonucleotides that allows them to be recognized by cells and internalized 
liposomal type of architectures. And this is really neat. Paul made a reference to proteins, that Mother Nature's figured out a way of making nanoparticles molecularly pure. Well, we looked at this and said, if that's true, we should be able to take proteins, modify their surfaces, and turn them into programmable atom equivalents, and use the same design rules that we've developed here to program the crystallization of proteins and enzymes. And it turns out you can do that, which is really kind of exciting if you think about it from both a structure control standpoint and an information standpoint and, a, and kind of a man over nature type of standpoint. But this can get really quite sophisticated when you start thinking about how you build and control materials design. We have a technique we call design by deletion, which takes advantage of those hollow structures that I showed you. And so here you can kind of do the thought experiment. You say, what if I made a BCC structure? That's what I showed you how to make two comparably sized particles that are complementary to one another. And what if I took one of those particles in the pair and replaced it with a hollow one? Well, in principle, from an inorganic standpoint, the arrangement of the gold particles, this goes from a, a BCC lattice to a simple cubic lattice. Okay, well, is that true? Well, here we go. You can see here's the BCC, or we could call the cesium chloride, depending on how you want to look at it. The simulation's in black, the data is in red, you can see the lines are all there. We go to simple cubic over here to the right. But now let's think about some of the structures that I showed you. I can begin to convert them into a lot of really exotic structures really rapidly. ALB2, if I get rid of the small guys with a hollow structure, this becomes simple hexagonal. If I get rid of the big guys with a hollow, it becomes graphite-like. If I take cesium-60-60 and I get rid of the small guys, it becomes BCC. That's not so interesting. I can make that another way. But this is a really cool one. If I get rid of the big ones, I get what we call lattice X. It has no mineral equivalent. Mother Nature has not figured out a way to make that particular structure. We made six different structures now that don't exist in nature in this regard. So it, it, again, it's, it's a powerful way of thinking about arranging matter in really unique ways. And I think that's going to lead to not only interesting structure control, but as I said, property control. Now it's important if you think about technology development to not just work with polycrystalline structures. And most of the things that I've talked about have been polycrystalline structures. What you'd like are single crystals. That's going to open up the ability to make new devices. Well, we couldn't do that for the longest time. In fact, until about a year and a half ago. Because we were thinking about it the wrong way. We were thinking about the system and this concept of, of defect control from the standpoint of, hey, we know where uh, the, the bond, we know the strength of the bonds because we've programmed them in these particular structures. We know the temperature at which they come apart and at which we can move defects throughout that particular crystal. And that's basically the melting curve associated with the, the material of interest where the DNA breaks apart. And so we, what we thought was we'd sit here in the melting transition and we could drive defect to the outside of the crystal. Kind of the way Paul was talking about it to some extent in the early part of his talk. And what that leads to is greater control. You get higher quality polycrystalline structures but you don't get single crystals. And then we thought about it. We said the way organic chemists do this is they typically go to higher temperatures, supersaturate the solution, and then they slow cool and allow the system to nucleate. And so we uh, built a, a, a modified PCR machine where we could control the temperature right here, a tenth of a degree for every 10 minutes. And if we take this system, remember all the particles are dispersed because you're above the melting temperature of the DNA, and now you cool through this, and out falls these beautiful rhombic dodecahedron crystals. And it happens every single time. Uh, it's a, an unbelievably reproducible type of, 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 of controlled crystallization because you program the parameters. It, it, it's limited to your understanding of, of, of how you make these structures and, and, and whether you can get to, as I said, the thermodynamic sink. And you can see very clearly here, beautiful facets. This is going to be a fantastic way of studying crystallization. Right? These are atoms on steroids, big structures, easier to uh, uh, visualize. It, it allows us to use a lot of techniques that we can't use with, with atomic-based systems very easily. But it extends to, as I said, anything. The particles go along for the ride. This is that important concept of bond uh, independent control over atom independent control. So here, this is the gold structure I showed you. Here's silver, rhombic dodecahedra. Why? It's a BCC structure. Here's gold and a protein. This is a catalase structure. This is controlling the crystallization of proteins now. Uh, quantum dot type structures. So, so the beauty of this is once you have the design rules and once you know how to make a particular structure, if you can turn them in, turn the particles into, into to a, a, a programmable atom equivalent, where again you have oligonucleotides forced upright in the appropriate density, you will drive the system to this particular structure. 
But you can begin to do lots of really interesting things here. I've talked about DNA, but we're not limited to DNA. You can go to RNA, LNA, lots of different types of interconnects, modified versions of nucleic acids. Why would you want to do that? Well, RNA is a more functional material from, for example, a catalytic standpoint. I can think about the bond in these types of materials not just as being a directing group, but as being a functional element where I have additional chemical functionality that aligns the struts, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. I can grow crystals off surfaces, layer by layer. This is our version of epitaxy, where I make one perfect layer, a second layer, a third layer, and a fourth layer. I can build structures like the one shown here, where I have hairpins that allow me to have expandable and contractible bonds, so I can move the particles apart and bring them back together, controlling the interactions between the particles. And you can do what we call topotactic interconversion, where we can take one set of particles and assemble them into one lattice, let's say a binary structure where we have two different components, and take a third component that can go in and bond to different uh, oligonucleotides within that existing lattice to transform it into a new type of architecture. And so this ability to, again, interconvert matter becomes, I think, really quite interesting and potentially quite important. And that kind of takes me to the next concept. So we kind of straddle in our group chemistry, biology, and medicine, as you can see. And one of the things that really has always uh, I guess just inspired and enthralled me is, is, is the concept of, of stem cells. This is an incredible, powerful concept that Mother Nature uses, the idea that you can have uh, 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 pluripotent stem cells, uh, and with the right types of chemical cues, you can differentiate those cells into functional cells that can be then used to build different types of tissues. And that is a powerful material synthesis uh, assembly type of, of concept. We don't have that in the nanoparticle area, or we didn't. We do now, because you can think about creating structures that can be evolved into new functional architectures with appropriate chemical cues if you design them properly. And so, for example, if we take particles, again, in cartoon fashion shown here, where we put strands of DNA on the surface, and I've color-coded them. These are just different sequences, two hairpins. You can see they, they, they fold over one another, and the recognition element is near the surface, so these particles can't recognize anything. Um, and so in the unbound state, these things just bounce into one another and they don't assemble. But if I supply the appropriate chemical cues, for example, and open up the red and the blue, which have been designed to recognize one another, that should form a BCC structure, right? Because two particles are going to come together, and I've already told you that that favors the formation of a BCC structure. If I add cues that open up the green strands, those are designed to be self-complementary. Go back to the part, original part of the talk. That should be an FCC structure. Well, we can test this. Whoops. In fact, we have. You can take these types of particles and you can use this concept to uh, uh, control the linker type, the stoichiometry, the linker density, and, and even the, 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 the size, the effective size of the particles, which then allows you to drive them down different types of crystallization paths. So that's kind of neat. One set of building blocks with the right chemical cues can be driven down many almost an infinite number of different types of crystallization paths, at least conceptually. Actually, I didn't throw in the data, but that, that, that is in fact the case. Um, so <clears throat> let me go back to this concept of, 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 of the, the atom and the bond. Um, some of you guys may be familiar with this concept of, of, of DNA origami um, and, and uh, what some people refer to as DNA nanotechnology. This is the idea of using oligonucleotides and hybridization to form uh, complex structures. A lot of people ask me, what's the difference between these two types of approaches? Let's start with the similarities. They use oligonucleotides. They have a programmability. They actually stop at that point. Why do they stop? Well, if you think about them, they're united by one concept, and that is the idea of controlled valency. The idea that you have to create a rigid structure with bonding elements that lead then to subsequent bonding and directionality is common to both. Here you get, through hybrid, get it through hybridization. Here you don't need that. We don't need hybridization to form valency. The particle core, the particle shape, and the dense packing of the oligonucleotides controls the directionality of the bonding. And of course, then the types of materials you get because these are purely organic structures and of course these are, are primarily inorganic uh, and materials that are defined by the particle composition or the atom in this particular case. Well, if that's true, then that means, as Paul said, controlling particle quality and controlling particle shape is important. So we spent a lot of time doing this, and we developed some of the, the, the best preps for making cubes, octahedra, rhombic dodecahedra, cube octahedra, concave cubes, tetrahexahedra, concave rhombic dodecahedra, uh, truncated ditetragonal prisms. Why? 
this is our way of controlling the valency of the atoms in these types of structures, the directionality of the bonding. And that allows you then to, to realize some interesting structures. And so just to, to quickly show you uh, some of the capabilities, if I take pr triangular prisms, directionality has a consequence. It forces these structures to stack on top of one another because that's where I get the most duplexes forming between them. If I take rods, these structures will assemble into sheets where all the rods are parallel to one another and hybridize in this direction. And if I have more three-dimensional objects like rhombic dodecahedra or octahedra, these types of structures assemble into three-dimensional materials. And you can see them here. So here are the stacks. Here are the sheets, and then here is the, the three-dimensional type of structure uh, assembled based upon these, these uh, particles recognizing one another. But this leads then to the ability to, to, to control um, crystal habit in kind of a unique way. If you think about this, you know, I showed you one example, a BCC structure forming a rhombic dodecahedron. What happens if you use cubes? Well, you get a cubic-shaped crystal. Right? Because that's the structure that's going to be the Wolf construction there. It's going to maximize uh, hybridization and, and lead to, to, to the thermodynamic, or is the thermodynamic sink. If I take octahedra and functionalize them, what I get are rhombic dodecahedra. I've already shown you how you can get that from spherical particles. But if I take rhombic dodecahedra and functionalize them, you get octahedra. So again, this neat ability to tune across different length scales is, is, is quite important. Let me skip here. I want to get to the last part. You can begin to use this to assemble really quite unique architectures. Here, here are disk type architectures that have been assembled, one dimensional rays. And, and what you say, what does that do for you? Well, this type of structure control now allows you to, to realize new properties and do very fundamental studies. So for example, if I take these types of disk architectures and assemble them into these, these systems, I can begin to ask, what does that do to the, the optical properties of these materials? Well, this is the plasmon resonance that people typically associate with these, these gold disks in, 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 in this particular system uh, in, the, in the free state. And then when they're assembled, you can see this blue shift. You can ask, why is that? Well, we can begin to experimentally study what's been proposed as this, this, this plasmon hybridization model, where you can begin to think again about these as atoms and from a, almost like an MO type of diagram. Uh, you have, when you bring them together, you have a bonding mode and an anti-bonding mode. But because <coughs> Um, of the dipoles in this case, uh, and the directionality of them, and the way they're assembled, uh, the bonding mode is actually a dark mode, and the anti-bonding mode is not. And that's why you see a shift to higher energy, whoops, as you go uh, from the, the disassembled state to the assembled state. We can take, with this approach, and make any sort of stacks we'd like. We can systematically control um, uh, the size of, uh, of the disks, the distances between the disks, all through choice of the different particle building blocks and the oligonucleotides holding these structures together. And that allows us then to tune properties in, 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 in really a, f a phenomenal way. And so here you can see if I take a, 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 an asymmetric system, I can begin to realize a system like this where again the, the dark mode is not completely dark. You can see it's diminished in intensity whereas the, 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 the bright mode is, 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 is of higher intensity and, and is in the antibonding state in this particular configuration. And so I guess my point here is that I can begin to build lots of materials uh, that don't exist in nature, uh, that begin to test some of the ideas and theories of, 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 of the, the folks that, 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 that are uh, in computer or designing systems that can't be made today, and in the process, begin to realize architectures that have new properties that can lead to a lot of applications that I think are going to be enabling, spanning many areas. And you might ask, what are those areas? One is plasmonics. One is photonics. Another one is catalysis, being able to systematically control the distances between these, making uh, uh, energy conversion materials. All this type of systematic control over the atomic, uh, the nano, and then ultimately the, 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 the macroscopic link scale I think is going to be quite important there. I'm getting the nod from the uh, director here, so let me go and, and acknowledge the folks that have done the work. If you're interested in this, Ned Seaman and I wrote a review in science that kind of outlines a lot of the similarities and differences between these areas and kind of maps out a lot of the evolution of this particular field. Um, but more importantly, um, a lot of the, the uh, important contributions have come from, from these folks here, in addition to my own group at Northwestern. I, I've got great collaborators, George Schatz, Monica Verde de la Cruz on the computational side of things. byung Du Lee is really quite important uh, in terms of the small angle scattering work done at Argonne. 
Um, and this guy, Rob McFarland, who's now a professor at MIT, he was a graduate student in my group. He's just off scale. You're going to see great things from him uh, coming forward. He helped uh, develop a lot of the design roles that I alluded to. And then my group at Northwestern, uh, these are the, the folks that really make it happen. Uh, in the audience, we have a fellowship winner, Jared Mason. Uh, he's, uh, again, somebody you, you should look for. And, and Matt Jones is, I think, a, a, a joint product of Paul and mine who is also coming out. He's done a lot of the, the plasmonic work that I alluded to. And, and, and again, I think you're going to see great things from him as well. I will stop. I like to show this uh, because the good people of, of, of Dubai um, have adopted the spherical nucleic acid <laughs> as their icon in their airport. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, magnificent talk. I wanted to keep a few minutes for questions. Uh, please. Bori. I wonder did you or anybody else consider the nonlinear optical properties of the circular wind law? It seems very promising, like combining nonlinear properties and all. Well, that's where a lot of that's headed. I mean, um, so so I, you know, I cut out a lot of this right here, but but this ability to 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 control all these parameters, and I, I would say control them uniquely. I, I can't think of a natural system or chemical system, any other chemical system, where you can independently control all of these different parameters, ranging from the particle size and shape, uh, the type of crystal that you get, uh, the, what it's functionalized uh, with in between the, the different particle building blocks gives you a playground to begin to look at optical effects in a very systematic manner. And, and, and we're headed down that path very aggressively. Uh, I can't provide you with a lot of advances there because this ability to make single crystals, so that's the final three-dimensional macroscopic control, just came about literally two years ago, about a year and a half ago. John, please. Um, there is potential. We, we actually have a, a program to try to make quasi-crystals. In fact, if you look at, uh, this was our first attempt. These are, the, these are the most sophisticated structures ever made. We actually thought we had quasi-crystals right here. These are actually clathrates. Uh, this becomes an unbelievable characterization assignment. We actually had to collaborate with uh, Sharon Glotzer and company to computationally look at this and try to figure out what exactly that is. It's an amazing architecture assembled from, from uh, by pyramids. Uh, it takes a lot of additional design consideration to begin to get the type of control that you want. I will not rule it out because I, I got to tell you, even a, a year ago, I would have ruled this out. <laughs> Just maybe one more question. I can actually uh, not only enumerate them, we've written them down. There, there, there are eight design rules. If you go to that review, eight design rules. And, and they're, they're, they're all dominated. Is that, well, you know, you, you've hit the nail on the head. So, 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 so I believe the beauty of this system is, is that you're decoupling bonding from atom identity. So uh, the rules don't care what the uh, uh, composition of the atom is in this case. It only cares about the size and the shape degree of DNA functionalization. 
And, and so when I got started in this field, one of the things that frustrated me was that there were so many phenomenological types of observations. Isn't this a neat structure? Isn't that a neat structure? And people didn't have design rules and principles that allowed them to systematically make materials architectures. They could make a lot of really neat structures, but they didn't know what they were going to be until they actually made them, and then they characterized them, and, and, and that was it. I wanted the ability to program architecture. And, and this actually allows you to do that. And, and it all, again, distills down to this, and, and it's overly simplified, but it's really an important concept because it works greater than 90% of the time. And that is that this type of, of chemistry is governed by uh, uh, the, the idea that uh, nature will favor the arrangement of particles that maximizes contacts that can lead to hybridization, that can lead to the duplex formation. And that you can uh, do simply by making geometric arguments and looking at all the different possibilities with simple structures, which lead to contacts that, that, can, that can engage in, 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 in hybridization. When you get to more sophisticated architectures like the one shown here, you have to begin to use computational tools. But the beauty is you can. So we have the inputs for these folks. So I, I think very shortly, I don't mean 20 years from now, I think four or five years from now, we are going to have computer programs where you're going to be able to say, I want this particular structure, this arrangement of quantum dots, this arrangement of, of metal nanoparticles, whatever I'd like. Um, and the program will spit out the size of the particles you need, the degree of functionalization, and the sequences that are required to get there. And then the conditions will be basically the, 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 the temperature at which, uh, as I said, the, uh, the on-off rates are, are fast. And that is coming very, very shortly. And, and, and I think it's extremely exciting because it's going to really drive then lots of people using this and then taking it much further than we have. Uh, you know, I'm dying for a lot of the, 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 the uh, uh, theoreticians and, and, and physicists to, to begin to uh, uh, get really interested in these types of materials and take them down different types of paths, both for fundamental study purposes, but also for, from an application standpoint. The genes don't learn? Oh, I think uh, they, 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 they kind of do. <laughs> so let's, let's postpone that to uh, the break. Udi Gazit for uh, the next talk. So the next two speakers are local. I don't need to say much about them. Uh, Udi, you know, was our vice president for research and then did some work for the government. And now we have him back yes, to doing professor. real research as a, as, a, as a real professor. You're on? Okay. I'm on. Well, as you know, I did research all the time, but now I have full-time research. So I'm, I, it's really a pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you, Ori and Adi, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be at this part of the of this symposium because I would like to convince you that we can use organic material, bio-inspired materials, to do things that are similar to what we see with the inorganic materials. And the second part of my talk will be on our work on PNA, which I think it's another branch of, we, we uh, demonstrated the first time the use of PNA for nanotechnology and we get some very remarkable uh, um, structures. Right mode. So our approach for many years already was to use non-biased reductionist approach to look for fundamental molecular recognition and self-assembly modules in nature. Uh, we went into smaller and smaller building blocks, as small as dipeptides, which were uh, the, the working horse for, 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 many for many years. But nowadays, we went even to smaller structures, so as small as, as uh, uh, amino acids and nucleobases, which give us new paradigms also for the disease. I, I will mention it in passing but more in the context of, of um, uh, this uh, symposium, we can make all kinds of architectures at the nanoscale, nanotubes, nanospheres, nanoplates, na uh, uh, hydrogels with nanoscale order, and we get unique physical properties, mechanical, optical, piezoelectric, semiconductive, and all with very simple building blocks in which we can control the formation of the structures and uh, uh, very uh, properties. A very interesting point, as, as I mentioned, our approach is really very systematic. I, I hope that in the short time that I have, I can convince you. But 
over and over again, we get into the same solution that nature had, had uh, provided us with. Uh, one very uh, intriguing uh, um, uh, example for us is what we found time after time the use of guanine nucleobases, part of the DNA recognition, but also guanine by itself is used in nature for things as diverse as physical colors in fish, the mechanism that allowed chameleon to change their, uh, uh, their colors, and reflectors uh, in uh, reptile eyes, including uh, uh, crocodiles. We are inspired not only from uh, uh, nature and uh, biological building blocks, but also from polymer chemistry. Uh, we are uh, the, very much into the field of supramolecular polymers. We demonstrate the ability of such build, simple building block to form ordered supramolecular polymers. Uh, and we also bring polymer chemistry concepts, uh, concepts into nanoscience and uh, 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 nanotechnology. Uh, oops. For example, this is quite recent uh, uh, um, work in which we demonstrate that this very simple building blocks, it's Bok diphenylalanine, can form all kinds of various architectures at the nanoscale, spheres, fibers, tubes, and uh, we see a typical phase uh, transition and phase separation, as you see with much larger polymers, and uh, uh, we uh, truly could uh, use polymer chemistry concept to understand these uh, uh, activities. I will just mention in passing how the, the recognition of very uh, fundamental building blocks could lead us to new uh, uh, understanding of biological phenomena. Uh, as I told you, we, by our uh, uh, very systematic uh, uh, approach, we demonstrate that uh, ordered structures that are related to disease could be formed by even single amino acids. Uh, this gave a new uh, uh, model for uh, uh, understanding the role of uh, amino acid structures in uh, uh, metabolic uh, uh, diseases and extend the way that we think about the organization of uh, uh, ordered assemblies in uh, uh, metabolic disorders. Yossi Klafter also mentioned the, uh, our Center for Drug Discovery and related to nanotechnology. I don't have the time to go into details, but by understanding, just to give you the, 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 hint, the, um, the flavor of what you do, by understanding the minimal recognition modules that facilitate the formation of uh, uh, pathological structures, we can design without thinking about the biology, just thinking about the chemistry and way to control uh, uh, these structures, we can manipulate uh, formation of various structures. We already have uh, uh, drug candidates that based on our uh, ability to understand the, the uh, uh, formation that uh, completed phase one clinical trials. We have uh, other few compounds in preclinical uh, uh, development. And uh, this was uh, uh, recently announced and uh, our agreement to uh, treat Parkinson's disease, the formation of amyloid in the case of Parkinson's disease, just by understanding the concept of molecular recognition and self-assembly. But today I would like mainly to focus on our ability to use, first of all, peptide nanotechnology and later on uh, PNA, peptide nucleic acid uh, and nanotechnology to get very interesting uh, uh, order. This starts in, uh, started in our uh, uh, reductionist approach, trying to identify the smallest recognition module uh, that could allow the formation of amyloid structures related to degenerative disorders. To make a long story short, double meaning, uh, we demonstrated that diphenylalanine, this very simple dipeptide, have all the molecular information needed to form well-ordered uh, 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 nanotubes. Uh, we later on, by playing around with the uh, uh, properties, we could get also the formation of nanospheres that are based on the, on the use of this concept, a dipeptide with two uh, aromatic building blocks. We we're also able to play around by synthetic chemistry and uh, 
include uh, a larger aromatic like naphthylalanin, uh, uh, all kinds of substitutions on the uh, aromatic rings like pentafluorophenylalanine to make teflon-like uh, uh, nanostructures. Uh, so we now have a catalog of about uh, 30 uh, or even more building blocks, dipeptide building blocks that can form all kinds of architectures at the nanoscale, which, as I will just mention, uh, have very unique physical properties. So one thing is to make all kinds of, of different nanostructures. Another thing, and it was referred also in the, in the talk of uh, Chad Mirkin, is to control the formation. And here the, the simplicity uh, and the, the minimalism of the, of the building blocks were very helpful for us. So we developed a, a methods including unidirectional growth to make these things like these nanoforests. Uh, we use um, inkjet printing to print these structures and something that I'm, I'm very uh, uh, proud of and uh, we also uh, got a patent on, on, on the concept itself. This was in collaboration with Gil Rosenman. It was the idea of using these building blocks, these uh, biological, bio-inspired building blocks uh, in order in, uh, uh, by utilization of physical vapor deposition. So we can move peptides from the solid phase to the gas phase and completely control the formation of these structures. So this is the uh, electron micrograph with the same magnification of the formation of these structures by self-assembly. We can have either 40 micron nanoforest or 4 micron uh, length, uh, uh, tube length uh, nanoforest just by controlling the self-assembly of the of these structures moving from the solid phase to the gas phase and then in a, in a cooler, uh, cooler uh, subject on uh, 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 control the assembly. So we can form the structures, we can control the formation. Now for the physical properties. We knew quite from the beginning that these are very rigid structures. Uh, but in order to determine really the, the, the mechanical rigidity, we had to use a, a, AFM. So we're using AFM indentation. So you apply force with the AFM tip on the structures and calculate the a, a measure, the point stiffness, and calculate the Young's modulus. So we could calculate Young modulus for these self-assembled structures built by non-covalent bond from dipeptide. Uh, we calculated Young modulus of about 20 gigapascal. For those of you who are less familiar with uh, mechanical rigidity, this is something in the order of uh, uh, bone or teeth uh, uh, rigidity. It's much more rigid than any uh, 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 plastic that we know. This was at that time, already 10 years ago, we claimed that this is the most rigid self-assembled uh, 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 structures uh, that could be achieved and nobody reputed it. Actually, in, uh, independently, a group in Nottingham, Soltendra group in Nottingham, calculated the Young's modulus uh, the, using uh, another method of uh, um, uh, bending beam and calculated Young modulus of about 29 gigapascal. Which, if this was a surprise, another surprise came when we wanted to, to study the nanospheres. So we used the same, uh, uh, the same type of experiment, applying force with the AFM, and nothing happened. Only when we changed the, uh, um, the, the uh, tip, the cantilever, into diamond-based cantilever, we could deform the structures. We measured point stiffness of about nearly 1,000 Newton per meter, and Young's modulus of about 200 to G, uh, 300 gigapascal. This is like good quality steel made by self-assembly of dipeptides, no covalent bonds. Uh, we are now collaborating with physicists, try to understand the, the, uh, uh, the basis for the uh, rigidity of the structures. Uh, the advantage of our minimalistic approach is the fact that you can now use not only classical me mechanics, but also a, a DFT and quantum mechanics methods to understand it. We still have many mysteries in this, uh, uh, in trying to understand the, the physical basis for the rigidity. Um, this is why I'm trying to convince more and more physicists 
to get into uh, 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 into this uh, uh, work. Later on, we discover all kinds. This again in collaboration with Gil Rosenman, all kinds of uh, uh, unique physical properties, uh, other physical properties, piezoelectric properties, similar to the best uh, inorganic uh, uh, piezoelectric material, lithium neobite. Semiconductive properties. I don't have the time to go into the into the uh, details, but uh, you can find all of this, uh, and I will give uh, uh, at the end. Uh, link to my website. Luminescent properties in the, uh, in this uh, 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 of these materials. It's not that we plan to have something that will have these unique properties. Probably not by serendipity, but by very systematic way, we identified a most fundamental recognition model or module that could allow the formation of these structures. And now there are many uh, different applications. Uh, uh, now, now this, due to the simplicity, this uh, uh, system is studied by hundreds of group around, uh, groups around the world. And every week I get, uh, I see uh, other applications that were done. Uh, Chad Mirkin mentioned a uh, metal organic framework. It was used to, uh, 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 to get the uh, diphenylalanine in uh, MOFs and use it as a, a uh, energy for the uh, providing uh, uh, translocation of nanoboats. Uh, last week there was some work on, on the uh, coating of stents with these materials. Where uh, use it for, uh, 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 for uh, synthetic photosynthesis. All kind of different ideas. Until recently, and, uh, when I would give such a lecture, people would say, well, it doesn't make sense. What is so unique about diphenylalanine? Yeah, and, and, uh, how can it be that, uh, 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 that uh, uh, important? And then I would say that it's uh, really in the, uh, in, for our uh, organism, organism like us, it's not very unique. But for uh, things like bacteria, they need some way to control the formation of the structures. And indeed, a few years ago, there was funding of a, 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 uh, an enzyme that all his uh, 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 activity is to cut the diphenylalanine motif, uh, 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 di proving the importance of such structures. Uh, I, would l I will skip this, and diphenylalanine is now studied by many groups. Uh, you know that some field is out of your hand when uh, uh, you see such as such reviews as self-assembly and the uh, application of diphenylalanine nanostructures, and for the first time when it appears in, the, in, in public. So this field was, uh, became too competitive. We had to switch to another one. And this was the use of PNA for, uh, 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 for nanotechnology. Our approach, we knew that dipeptides could form ordered structures. Uh, so uh, we synthesized all the dif uh, 16 different combinations of uh, uh, dipNA. So PNA, it has a, a peptoid backbone and side chains of, of DNA and RNA. And we discovered this relates to one of my, my first uh, slides, that only guanine controlling, uh, guanine containing uh, uh, building blocks could form such structures. And I don't have to convince you about the importance of DNA after uh, uh, technology after the, the, uh, the talk of Chad Mirkin. When we solved the crystal structure of these uh, assemblies, we discovered that what we had in mind really happened. We, on the one hand, we had the stacking, as we see with uh, 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 peptide-based structures. But we also get the Watson-Crick uh, 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 interactions between the, uh, uh, the bases ended up in very dense uh, uh, materials. And when you get new structures, you get also new physical phenomena. And we could see a phenomenon known as red edge excitation shift. Uh, this is a, a phenomenon seen in glassy materials, in a, a graphene oxide, in which you have a, a different a, 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 a emission based on the excitation wavelength. Very recently, and just this is, will be my, my uh, very last slides, uh, uh, Inspired by our ability to show that a single uh, amino acid can form all the structure, we ask ourselves whether a single PNA could form 
the same uh, uh, assemblies. And again, non in a non-biased way, we discovered that only guanine protected PNA, peptide nucleic acid, can form all the structures. And now see the structure that this very simple building group form. These are uniform uh, uh, assemblies. It looks like silica particles made by the self-assembly. You don't need to do anything. You boil this into the water and cool the, uh, 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 and cool the, uh, the solution. We get the, the spontaneous formation of this array, hexagonal array of these structures, which act as photonic crystals. Uh, you see the, the, the colors that you see here. During the time that we wanted to publish it, there was a work not from our group, uh, a very nice uh, work from a group in France on the way that chameleons change their color. This is by guanine, our same guanine photonic crystals. And, ch and the changing of the spacing is based on the changing of the, uh, of the ionic strength and thus this, uh, 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 you can have a rapid change of color by using photonic crystals. So we can do the same thing with our system. Uh, I didn't have a lot of time and I wanted to show you the, the, the different uh, uh, activities. Uh, I would like to convince you that, this, uh, that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Uh, of course, this is work of uh, many talented students working on these directions and others. And since I moved very fast and showed all kinds of uh, uh, applications that we do in the lab, you're more than welcome to visit my website and see the original papers with the hyperlink. Thank you very much. So we do have time for a quick question. Yes, Chad, please. The role of the guanine. So, Okay, this is, this is quite amazing. Uh, uh, so the role of the, it's, it's done only with guanine. And as you know, guanine is used in nature not only in those uh, in the examples that I mentioned, but also in the molecular level, like uh, G4, quadruplex, and others. This is due to the pattern of uh, hydrogen bonding and, and the um, uh, planarity of the molecules that allow the formation of the structure. Why these are uh, 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 uniform structures? I discussed it with experts in the field. Nobody have uh, 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 shown such example with building with uh, self-assembly of building blocks. It means that probably there's, uh, from the energetic point of view, there's a, a, a curvature that is most thermodynamically stable, probably due to geometry. But this is not enough because it's a multi-layer. A phenomena. So uh, it is probably a balance between the ideal curvature and the entropic penalty that you pay for the uh, uh, formation of the, of the various uh, structures. Actually, we, we just discussed it with uh, uh, Mike Cates, the uh, uh, Lucasian uh, chair in, in, uh, in Cambridge, who told us that he never saw such a system. And it's, it's really intriguing to, to understand the balance between the, the energetic penalties of the two, uh, uh, two structures. But... Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, we want to start. Uh, so we are going to start now the third and uh, final uh, session of this uh, symposium today, uh, which will uh, focus on... Uh, the interaction of uh, light or electromagnetic waves with the nanostructures. Uh, so uh, our first uh, speaker is uh, Professor Sir John Pandry. He's also uh, the uh, Dan David uh, Laureate for this year. And uh, so we don't, uh, the, the common theme in this uh, symposium is that we don't uh, say all the prizes because then it will take a long time. But we do mention the connection with Tel Aviv. So I, I should say that uh, Professor Pendry was here one year ago. He gave a very nice uh, uh, tutorial on, uh, uh, in, in the winter school that we had uh, last year, nanophotonics. And he's going to come again in next winter, right? For uh, another uh, winter school that we have. So it's a pleasure to, to have you. Uh, and now we look forward to, to hear your talk. So please. Thank you very much, Adi. It's a pleasure to be back in Tel Aviv. Um, do I have a pointer? Um, because I will need one.
okay, we got that up. Okay, I'm ready to go. Right, I, I want to talk about how we control nanoscale light. Uh, but first, I should mention um, some people who are involved with that. Um, Paloma is actually here today. Uh, she's a postdoc in, in our group, and uh, she's one of the scholarship awards. And I'm going to mention some of her work. Oh, I should stay near the microphone. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yes, so Paloma I mentioned, and uh, all, all these people have been involved with the work I'm going to talk about today. So why, why should we want nanometer control of light? Well, um, using light to see very small objects inside a living cell. And there was the Nobel Prize for this a couple of years ago. Um, the Abbe law of uh, diffraction limits what you can see with a conventional microscope to something a bit less than a micron. And that's just where the really interesting things inside cells begin to reveal themselves. So uh, biologists uh, are, are really desperate to, to have microscopes that can see beyond this, this limit. Um, we conventionally make electronic circuits for laptops and iPhones using light to, to, make, to make those circuits. And, and so we're, to some extent, we're already controlling it on the nanoscale. Might want to send sing, single molecules. Uh, problem here is that if, if light, if a photon is, is, is about a micron across and a molecule is about a nanometer across, it's a conversation between a mouse and an elephant. And if you could bring the photon to crush it down to the same size as a molecule, then the probability of, of the photon interacting with that molecule will be much, much greater. Um, another issue which we might run into is to make light interact with light. So electrons interact with le electrons very readily because of their charge. And through that, we have e extremely sophisticated control of electrical currents, which ultimately lead to uh, all, all, all the chips inside your computers and, and iPhones and so on. But light doesn't naturally talk to light. This uh, beam of laser light passes straight through all the other photons which are coming uh, into the lecture theater. And to make it talk to light, you need very, very high densities of photons. Um, at the moment, that implies very high powers. But if you could take the same power and pass it, pass it through a much smaller area, you could get the same density of photons and still uh, and, and still see the nonlinear effects, um, but at much lower power densities. Power, energy density are different things, of course. And then you can do tricks like switch light, but also these, these lovely things like uh, time reversing light, which is, I'm just waiting for that to happen big time uh, on the nanoscale. So I've already mentioned the Abbey limit, which says that using conventional optics, you can only focus to something a little better than half a micron. So, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Today's deliberate mistake. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is Snell's law, which you all know. And today, it's still used to design equipment. Why is that? Because we obviously have Maxwell's equations and have had them for 150 years or so. And the reason is that if you stare at Maxwell's equations, it's very hard to decide how light will move at a surface. Uh, somebody in the audience put his hand up and said, yes, I find it obvious from Maxwell's equation. I, how many of you find it obvious? I, I wonder. I don't. Um, and the reason we use Snell's law is that it gives us this tremendous intuitive feel of how light moves. We, we have a picture of light as a stream of particles, a stream of photons. Uh, which change their direction when they meet an interface. And if you want to design a lens for a camera, you can imagine how if you change the shape of the surface of the lens, then you would change the direction of the photons. Uh, so it's very intuitive, but also it misses out a huge amount of uh, the physics because it knows nothing about the wave nature of light. It doesn't even know that some of this light, this, this beam can split into two and some of it reflect from the surface. 
And also, it has absolutely nothing to say about the nanoscale because all this is predicated on the assumption that the dimensions are much greater than the wavelength of light because if they're not, you can't define rays of light. They immediately spread out into something else. So what we must do is delve inside the structure of the photon. And when we do that, we find, as I'm sure all of you know, that light consists of electric and magnetic fields dancing around one another. And the first guy to uh, point that out was uh, a combination of uh, Michael Faraday and James Clark Maxwell, who completed the picture. And what Faraday did was to introduce a very new concept into the way we describe electricity and magnetism, and indeed all force fields. So before Faraday, people talked about forces such as gravity or electrostatic forces or magnetostatic forces. They spoke about them in terms of action at a distance and the force acting on, along the line co connecting the two particles which were interacting or the two charges. Um, but Faraday had a different way of looking at things. He introduced an intermediary, which is the field. And he said that what happens in magnetism, if you have a force between a north and south pole, is that first one of the poles creates a field. And it's says that field which exerts the force upon the second uh, pole. Now, you might think that's a sort of unnecessary decoration of the theory of magnetic force. Because usually we take the simplest explanation and it's undoubtedly action at a distance along the line separating the uh, poles that is the simplest. This is the way Faraday thought about it and the reality of his fields he, he could reveal with this experiment, which kids still do, I suppose, in which you put a piece of paper over the magnet and scatter iron filings, which then trace out the field lines. Now, that was actually, although it was a decoration of the existing theory, it was an absolutely crucial step because the forces in electromagnetism, as opposed to the forces in magnetism, cannot be described by action along the line separating the interacting objects. You, you have to have uh, another dimension which provided by the field. And so Faraday uh, showed that if, if the magnet was encircled by a coil and there was no motion in the system, then nothing happened. But if you move the magnet, then you saw a deflection in the galvanometer because it induced an electrical current in the coil. And he sh uh, showed that the EMF, the electromotive force in the coil, was proportional to the rate at which these field lines cut the copper wire. And so you have the field lines going this way, uh, the copper wire going that way, and the motion going this way. It's essentially three-dimensional, and the, the field was central to the way you describe that. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, a, a paradox, I, I, I feel, that um, Faraday was a man who knew no mathematics. He, he was a son of a poor blacksmith and self-taught, uh, but one thing he didn't teach himself was mathematics. He, he was confessedly ignorant of mathematics. And yet it was this construction, uh, the invention of field theory, which actually nearly all of modern physics is formulated in terms of field theory. And he was the guy who knew no maths and uh, thought about it. Uh, but somebody who did know a hell of a lot of maths was uh, James Clark Maxwell. And he put the whole thing together. And uh, this, this was his mathematical formulation, of course, as you all know. And he added this equation here, which makes the equation symmetric in electric and magnetic fields. And it's these fields which we're going to use to replace the rays of light. So instead of thinking of physical entities of streams of particles, we're going to think of bundles of fields as the elements we manipulate because these are the ingredients of Maxwell's equations. And if we make our formulations consistent with Maxwell's equations, then we have an intuitive picture which at the same time is exact at the classical level. 
So there's Maxwell. Um, and somebody else who's part of our story is uh, somebody who needs no introduction, Albert Einstein. And he also had a theory of fields. So Newton said that gravity was action at a distance along the line separating the two objects, sun and earth, what have you. And Einstein said, no, that w what happens is a field is created and the field is, is, is the metric which is, describes how the gravitating object, in this case the sun, distorts space. So he didn't dismiss space as nothingness, it was just another material with properties. And, what, and the property he was concerned with was geometry. And he described the geometry, as many of you will know, in terms of the metric. And the metric just tells you how much space is crushed or stretched uh, by uh, a, 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 a gravitating object. So uh, that was his picture. Um, and because space is curved, the planets do not move in a straight line as they would in a flat space. They move in curves. They move in orbits around the sun. And he could explain all that. But one thing that uh, he did say was that of course space is, is, is curved, then um, light moving through a curved space should also notice that and should also be bent. And that was very, very controversial. Because Newton had said that gravity acts between two massive objects. And here, in the case of the sun, only one of the objects is massive. Um, it's a bit like Blackadder, for those of you who know that series. Those of you who don't, it's a <laughs> secret joke. But only one of them has to be massive. And that was very, very controversial and denied by, by many people, but was confirmed in a famous experiment in 1919, uh, which was a sort of reconciliation between, designed as such, between the two nations after the war, because Einstein was a pacifist, and, and also uh, Arthur Stanley Eddington was a pacif pacifist. He was a Quaker. And they were in correspondence about this theory, and Eddington, an astronomer measured uh, the deflection of starlight by the sun uh, during an eclipse, because obviously you can't see the stars if there isn't an eclipse. And it was consistent with Einstein's theory, and that, that was one, is one of the pillars on which Einstein's theory of general relativity is based. So we're going to take, the, take these ideas of bending space as part of our way of manipulating light. So we imagine that if, if uh, we start with uh, a field line, uh, it could be electric or magnetic. Uh, it could also be the pointing vector, which you can say is more or less like a ray of light because it's a flow of energy. And if we want this to go in a different direction, then we can pull on space. And these field lines are embedded in space, so if you move space and stretch it and pull it, then the field lines have to move with it. Uh, so we pull a bit on this rubber space and the field lines move and when we get them where they want to go, that's it. Now something else that Einstein said was that um, if you rewrite Maxwell's equations in the notation of general relativity, including his metric which describes how much space is bent, then what happens is that the metric sits in the same place as would the refractive index in Maxwell's equations. And so you don't have to have a black hole or something massive close by. You can simply ask what would be the metric of this space and then say, oh yes, well that's okay. We can do metrics for light using the refractive index. Uh, actually, a more precise way of saying it would be uh, Einstein said you, you can find out how to transform epsilon mu so that if you have this bent space here, then uh, through uh, you can regard this as a coordinate transformation. And the first derivative of that transformation then tells you what values of epsilon mu at every point would send the light in this direction. Now I hear you cry, that isn't very intuitive, so I'll give you an intuitive way. There's still a formula. Uh, so let's ask 
what happens to the simplest distortion of space, um, what, what happens to epsilon and mu. So I'm going to crush space in this direction. And if I have a pointing vector like this, think of it as a ray of light, then the ray of light will follow a bent trajectory if you make a squashing of this middle section here. Now, I could, could prove that to you, but I, I don't have enough time to, to do that. So let me just state the conclusions. They're very simple. If you squash space in this direction, then along the direction of squashing space, epsilon and mu are decreased by the same factor as you squash space. Of course, you've squashed it in this direction, so space is anisotropic, and in the direction perpendicular to the squashing, epsilon mu actually increased by the inverse of the squashing factor. So, decrease, increase. And I could actually crawl over this piece of distorted space here, and I could ask myself how much this is squashed in this direction, this direction, this direction, how much it has been twisted, and I could tell you, using a ruler and a protractor, what epsilon and mu will be at every point in this space. So we have a geometrical equals, in my mind, an intuitive way of thinking about how to um, uh, move rays around uh, in a manner which is exact at the level of Maxwell's equations and therefore applies on the narrow scale. Now, just I don't want to talk about invisibility today because I've talked about it far too much, but I will mention it because it is um, a beautiful illustration of the power of this method. So, very, very briefly, uh, to make this central object invisible, what you have to do is to guide light rays around it and, and then have them emerge on the other side so that they're traveling in the same straight line as they would be if there wasn't anything there. Uh, so you're allowed to deviate the lines, making them flow like water, but they've got to come out in exactly the same path as they would do if there wasn't anything there. So anybody looking here sees straight through this thing and sees what's on the far side. Now, you could, if that cloak was big enough, use the laws of refraction to design that cloak. But it would be very, very hard. Think how you would do it. So, you say to your grad student, we're going to build a cloak. Go away and figure. So, he, he uh, sits down and uh, says, well, you know, I've got to bend this ray of light here, so I'll do something with the refractive index. Yeah, it looks good. Going around this guy here, but oops. I've forgotten where the light comes in here. Okay, so you go back, you remember that, you fix that, you make it come out in the right direction. And then you say, well, okay, that's good, but what about this other ray that comes in here? This is going to follow a different trajectory, but it's going to go through some of the other stuff which you fixed in order this ray to be right. All right, so what you have to do, it's, it's a non-local problem, because you have to remember at all times what's gone in all other places here and about all the other rays. And you could do it in a computer, but it would be a very, very hard challenge for anybody who's thought about how to compute things like that. It's, it's a very difficult problem. Look how transformation optics could solve it. So what we do is start with an empty sphere, and we're going to make a hole in it. Space is made of rubber, so I'm going to cut a little hole here, and then I'm going to push all of space into this annulus here. I'm going to crush it. And then you could use my formula to uh, say uh, that space has been squashed in this direction and stretched in the other direction, and you could find what the very simple formula for what epsilon and mu must be at every point here. And as you do this, then the rule is that any pointing vectors or rays of light, any field lines will be pushed into this area here and they cannot enter this region here because everything has been shoved out. So this is hidden, can't see in there. Uh, but the really difficult thing of not casting the shadow of not disturbing the lines here, that is automatically achieved. If you move space, you move the rays with the space. If you don't move space, 
you don't move the rays. So a very, very simple answer to a problem which would approach it in the wrong way would be extremely complex and difficult to solve. Um, so when you do that, you design the cloak. And what's more, uh, the laws for cloaking work not only for rays of light, a pointing vector, but they've also been demonstrated to work for static magnetic fields. There was an experiment about five years ago which showed that. So the, 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 the formula seems to work, and now what I want to do is to get on to, to nanotechnology and see how we would use this in nanotechnology. Well, the challenge I, I set early on was to bring light to a very, very fine focus, to crush light into uh, something which is of the order of a square nanometer or less. Uh, and I'm going to use um, surface plasmons to, to, to do that. And just to say to those who, who are not familiar with this area, uh, metals such as copper, gold, silver, um, the, the electrons are free to move inside them and behave like a sea. And on the surface of this sea are waves, charge density waves, which we call surface plasmons. And they propagate along the surface. And they can have very, very short wavelengths. Uh, wavelengths down to something of the order of the spacing between the electrons in, in the metal, which is about an atomic <coughs> radius, of course. So very, very short wavelengths. And so these things can focus uh, the energy they contain uh, very closely. And they can couple to light. So if you have a dipole here and this waveguide type of structure, then this dipole in an excited state can give up its energy and excite these surface waves, which then propagate off to infinity. So this is uh, uh, the, the standard mother system which we start with. Uh, but the problem is that, of course, the light is not going anywhere you want it to. It's, it's going off to, to infinity here. So we're going to do this space stretching exercise. And it, it's easy. We can do this in, in one, two, or three dimensions. But it, it's, since I'm going to be drawing stuff, I'm going to do it in two dimensions. And in two dimensions, there are very uh, neat transformations called com conformal transformations which you can use. So z is x plus i, y, as we all know. And what I'm going to do is an inversion uh, a coordinate transformation. And this inversion has the property that it takes points at the origin, which I take at the center of the dipole to infinity, and it takes points at infinity to the origin. And points in between map into something else. So this waveguide structure, uh, a plane maps into a cylinder, and depending on the distance of the origin from these planes, the cylinders have uh, different radii. The dipole itself is two very large charges close together. If you map it, it's two very large charges far apart, and that produces a uniform electric field, which could, in fact, be due to um, a, a, an, an incident wave. And so, uh, uh, yes, and so these points at infinity map to the origin, which is here. So what it boils down to is that this system is entirely equivalent. Once you've solved this system, you know what's going to happen here. An external electric field is harvested at this point here and travels not to infinity, but to the origin, which was infinity. And there, uh, it, it uh, is, is very heavily concentrated. Here, here's another mapping. Um, sorry, I had hoped to have another slide there. Um, OK, so what happens when you concentrate the light here is that these waves travel around. And as they travel, they go slower and slower. And it's like cars on the expressway. So if they go slower, they come closer together. So the energy density, the wavelength decreases, but also the energy density goes up. And if it were not for losses, then the energy would be infinity here. There are losses, but in fact, the energy is not, um, um, the, the, the energy densities you achieve are, are, are very high, as I'll show you later. But um, another thing I'd 
want to point out about these structures, actually I don't have time, so I'm not going to do that. Um, now, it's been known for a long time, uh, empirically, that surfaces which are rough and have singularities in them, sharp points or uh, curved surfaces which touch one another, they, they are magnets for incident electromagnetic waves and they do concentrate the energy very intensely there by many orders of magnitude. But it wasn't understood uh, before this way of looking at things that they pretty much all have a common origin. So we start with the waveguide structure always, which I've explained carries waves off to infinity. And by picking the right transformation, you can transform this into, uh, you've seen the two spheres, cylinders already, we can do two spheres as well, or a crescent, or these structures here, depending how you choose the parameters. And this one I like very much, so a periodic array of waveguides actually transforms into a knife edge. And all these structures have, um, all these structures here are actually related to this mother structure here and have a common origin. And by the way, the translational symmetry of the waveguide gives you a Bloch's theorem. It enables you to calculate everything analytically and to classify the states into Bloch states. And uh, even though these states appear to not ha have any symmetry, they actually have a mother system which has lots of symmetry. So here are some pictures um, made quite a while ago um, in which we show light being harvested to these points here. And you can see the change in wavelength as the light goes into this point here. And actually things go off scale, but there's a very, very high density here. It's easier to see this effect as uh, in case of a, here we have a crescent. And what I'm going to do is to plot the field intensity as a function of this angle here. So it's around 180 degrees that we're going to see these enhancements. So here's the field intensity divided by the incident field intensity. Note the scale. And so as you come, as the waves are excited and then come into the harvesting point, the wavelength decreases. But again, this motorway effect, you are crushing the light and achieving very high field densities. The energy density is the square of that, so that's a million in the energy density. And the uh, response to things like Raman signals are that squared. So you can quite see how you get surface enhanced Raman scattering from these sort of effects. Very, very powerful concentrators of energy. Here's a plot of what happens if you bring two uh, cylinders together. When they fire apart, there's just the single uh, dipole resonance of the cylinder, but as you bring them together, the modes spread out and eventually they move, merge into a continuum. This, this is a very interesting system mathematically because um, when two cylinders touch, uh, they're a finite object, but they have a, 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 a continuous spectrum. Uh, finite objects usually have uh, a, 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 a discrete spectrum. But if, if there are singularities in them, which can be ma mapped to an infinity, then uh, the spectrum is, is continuous. It's a curious mathematical point. Um, OK, so uh, those, those are, are finite objects. Uh, you can now uh, think of other transformations. Here's one which makes a real mess of a, a good old Cartesian mesh. And what we're going to do is to choose two of these surfaces of the surface of a grating. Now this isn't a grating because of these are flat surfaces which you can, for which you can calculate the spectrum. So I'm going to use two of these surfaces to bound a, a slab of material. And they map into this structure here and you can see that after the map, mapping you do have a grating because this surface is curved periodically. And that has been exploited. Um, this is some work by Paloma, whose name, name I mentioned earlier, and who you'll have a chance to see uh, later this afternoon. And she uh, uh, thought about realizing this in, in graphene. And the great thing about graphene is that you can model this grating by simply uh, altering the doping, which you do by putting DC electrostatic biasing outside. 
Uh, and if it's not DC, you can actually make this dynamic. So it's a really fun system to play with. But just let me show you some of the simple results we, we have. So if you make that grating, you can calculate from how a flat surface, the modes of a flat surface, you can then calculate the modes of this grating. They're the same. And here are the absorption cross-section of a, 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 a graphene grating doped in that manner. Um, the electron density in graphene is rather low, and so the frequency of the waves is in the terahertz radiation, so it's about a uh, hundredth of an EV. And remarkably, by doping the graphene in this grating manner, you can absorb almost all the light which falls on the grating at certain frequencies. Uh, so something one atom thick can actually grab nearly all the light that falls on it. And you can switch it on and off at gigahertz frequencies. So, th so that's, that's quite spectacular, I think. Um, what else? Yes, so this, this is a similar calculation it, it, where the, the um, grating is, uh, the graphene grating is replaced by silver, and here we, we see the, the, the grating between these two lines here, and um, we can calculate uh, analytically uh, what the, the profile is of the, um, the plasmon excitor. And you can see that what happens is that as the um, plasmon goes along the grating, it actually has to duck inside here. And so again, it, get, it gets compressed, and you get a high density of radiation there. What else can we do with transformation optics? Well. Years ago, I was interested, and this is how I got interested in plasmonics, um, in electron energy loss. This is a really, really <laughs> old paper. And uh, what we calculated at that time was the energy loss by an electron traveling parallel to a flat surface. And the surface waves, the plasmons in the metal, travel rather slowly. And the electron, if it has 20 keV, travels rather quickly. So it creates a, a sort of plasmonic boom, if you like. And it sends out lots of surface plasmons. And that's a dominant electron energy loss when a, a, an electron goes near to a surface. So, um, But you might want to look at a more complex situation, which is, is this one here. So we, we have our fast electron again. But now instead of a flat surface, we've got two cylinders that it's passing by. Um, and we, we can now treat this using transformation optics because the electron has a simple tra trajectory. It goes so fast that lo losing an EV or two doesn't alter uh, the trajectory. And so you can very simply calculate what the uh, fields are that this electron creates. But the modes that it's exciting here are, are complex, and that to do this calculation all in this frame is very difficult. So you don't. You do an inversion, and then that takes these two kissing cylinders back into this flat plane here. Now, the electron has a messy trajectory here, but that doesn't matter because you've already calculated its potential in this frame, and it transforms into this frame here. And all you have to ask is how these, uh, the, these, the, the simple modes of this waveguide respond to the excitation which the electron is giving to it. And that calculation you can do. It's been do it done by Yu Liu, who's now a professor in Singapore. And here is the spectrum. There is the uh, uh, surface plasmon of a flat surface and the, the modes which hybridize symmetrically and anti-symmetrically. And here, here's the dipole mode of the system at the low, lowest frequencies. And these are different electron velocities. The beauty about electron excitation is that the selection rules are far less severe than they are for light, so you excite far, far more modes. Uh, and so you can get an understanding of these systems in this way. Now, the last time I tried this, well, it doesn't even show. I have a movie here. So, whoa, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, the movie doesn't even show, so I won't show it. But I want to finish with 
um, th these are uh, practical things about how we can understand um, how uh, plasmons are excited at surfaces, how we can draw light down to the nanoscale and make its density thousands, millions of times higher than it, it would be otherwise. But I, I want to go back to Einstein and show that, that this way of looking at things can um, explain something else that I was involved with and show that, that it, it's, it's not as trivial as you might think of at first. So this, this is an idea which uh, Veselago had many years ago. So here's refraction, a la Snell's law. And here is a different sort of refraction which Veselago said should be possible. And if you define this as a positive angle, then clearly this is a negative angle. And according to Snell's law, this, sh this should imply that this medium here is a negative refractive index. And it was uh, through the use of metamaterials that this, this was realized long after Veselago's paper. But I want to give you another take on that because um, another thing which Veselago said was that you could make a, a lens out of this. And um, you can see that if you have these parameters here, so that these angles are equal, then you focus the light back to the axis and you do so twice. But what Veselago didn't realize was that this lens could be perfect. And in fact, if you perfectly realize these parameters, it is perfect. And that's something I pointed out a long time ago. But there's a different way of looking at this um, which can show that it's perfect. So I'm going to use my... Uh, I have to stay near the microphone. I'm going to use my trick of squashing space to, to make a negative refractive index, okay? So I take some space and I, I do the squashing. And as I've told you, the, um, refract the epsilon and mu, which are perpendicular to the squashing, increase. So the more you squash, the bigger they are. And as you squash very, very hard, infinitely hard, then epsilon and mu go up to infinity. Now, you all know what happens to things that go up to infinity. They come back at minus infinity. Think of 1 upon x, all right? It goes through plus infinity, then minus infinity. And it's exactly the same with these things here. So I squash a bit more, and these things uh, then go to negative values because I've gone through infinite squashing to negative squashing and I made some negative space. But look what's happened in the way. So we've made something with a negative refractive index by squashing. But what's happened to space? It's something really crazy. Okay, so this space, it was squashed. You can sort of understand that. But what about this space? Huh? It's, a, it's got three manifolds. It's triple valued. And so what the light does is if it comes to a whoops, if it comes to a focus here and it goes around the corner, it comes to a second focus because it retraces its steps. And then when it comes to the second edge, it goes back again to where it came from. And and so what the what you think is happening is that the light's going through here, but what the light thinks it's doing because it sees this as a metric of the space is that it thinks it's going around here. So it actually sees a focus three times. Now that's a statement which is not made depending on the ray approximation. It's a statement which depends on Maxwell's equations. And so according to Maxwell's equations, this focus, if it's perfect here, or if this is the origin of the light, then the focus should be perfect here and perfect here as well, with uh, providing you realize all the parameters. And so that, that's one way of, um, of looking at negative refractive index. So it's time for me to finish. In pra I've probably gone over time, actually. Sorry. Um, what I hope to have shown you is that this, this way of transformation optics, of looking at optics on the nanoscale, is, is a very powerful tool. It's 
it's an aid to your imagination as much as a way of calculating things. Uh, and also it reveals to us some very profound things about the geometry of optics. Uh, I challenge a cosmologist to give you an example in the cosmos of negative space. But we can do that with optics. And then just to conclude, uh, since I'm over time, I will leave you to read the conclusions. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent talk. So, are there any questions? Yes, please. If what do we learn from this from the perspective of stealth technology? Uh, you're, you're taking me back to invisibility. <laughs> well, you learn that you can hide something and people have built. You learn that you can hide something and people have built cloaks, yes? You build a material which which does this job of a live. Yeah, it depends on the material, and I use uh, or, or experimentalists use things called metamaterials to realise the structure of that cloak. And the criteria for the material which is in sunrise through solar You apply my formula to the crushing argument, and you you get a material which has a large refer a large epsilon in this direction and a small one in this direction. Same from you. It's a very simple formula. David. Yeah, I want to go back to Maxwell. Do you know if, if Maxwell realized that his equations were not always absolute? Um, he didn't tell me if he did. <laughs> uh, it's not known to me, no. Do you know it? Well, I do know that he fretted very, very much about his equations. And in those, you see, uh, up to about the time of Maxwell, people uh, described things in terms of, uh, you know, um, light is something that moves in rays. It was very, very pictorial. And, and these days, in, certainly in physics, you're not content with a subject until you have an equation which describes it. But, but it, that really started about Maxwell's time. And he was very worried that his equations were not just mere equations that describe reality. And he constructed all sorts of models with rollers interlocking in space like gears to try and, and show that his, his model in his equations really did describe reality. With, with the perfect? Perfect plans that you have buses. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so that's, that's a, a very insightful question. Uh, it ruins it. <laughs> and the reason is that uh, the way, um, what you have to do in the perfect lens is, uh, I didn't describe it in detail, is that um, you, you have to take those um, waves which are localized near the surface and decaying exponentially, and you've got to boost them back to the level, level that they were where they started from. And the way you do that is using resonances to amplify uh, the signal. Uh, resonances are, are devices which can gather energy on the fly and can build up very, very high amplitudes without having a power source within them. But the uh, finesse of a resonance is limited by losses, and so uh, the resolution of a perfect lens is, 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 is not an aperture limited resolution. It's limited by the degree to which you can build perfect resonances, and that's a question of loss, I'm afraid. Okay. So now we move to the second talk by Dr. Tal Ellenbogen from the School of Electrical Engineering. Uh, building new optical metamaterials one atom at a time. Thank you very much. Let's see if it opens. Okay, so uh, can I use it? <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you for the pointer. I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to give this talk. This is a great honor for me. 
Uh, I will talk about building new optical materials uh, one atom at a time. And uh, I would like to start with uh, a short video showing uh, Richard Feynman talking about what we can achieve if we could put atoms in space uh, one at a time. So let's see what he says. Okay, so he needs a humoristic tone. He says that if we can, based on a potential landscapes, we put the atoms in the right place, then we don't need chemical reactions. We simply can engineer the materials. Well, uh, we've seen great talks today, but uh, with the atoms, we are still not quite there. However, thanks to a, a concepts laid by uh, Sir John Pendry and uh, others in the field in optics, we have this mindset for a few years now. We can take a nanoscale system that acts as an uh, optical atom and put them one by one to construct materials. And these materials are called, as we know, uh, metamaterials, or in their uh, two-dimensional version, they are called metasurfaces. So how do we construct them? We start usually with one meta-atom that we know how it interacts with light put it in a lattice that has an important role in the behavior, and usually it is a dense last lattice much more uh, dense than the wavelength, and by that we create our surface or material which has artificial microscopic optical properties, and uh, we uh, are able to reach the ultimate, uh, ultimate goal of me and others in this field to be able to tailor the interaction between light and matter. And today I will describe uh, three uh, such different atoms that we work with uh, in my group. I will start with the uh, uh, silicon uh, nanowires on silicon wafers and show how they allow us to control the linear is isotropic scalar relation between light and matter. Then I will move to a plasmonic cross shape nano antenna, they are called nano antennas, and show how we can get linear anisotropic tensor relations. And finally, I will finish with the split ring resonators and will show how we can get both linear, sorry, and uh, nonlinear uh, tensor relations this way. So, uh, let's start with the first one. <laughs> okay, I can leave it down, I guess. Here, uh, you see my face reflected off a silicon wafer. Silicon is a gray material and it is highly reflective. However, if you nanostructure it and create these nanowires on top of the silicon, uh, made also from silicon, it was shown a few years back that you get very awkward optical effects. Suddenly, silicon starts to take color, and you can see that the color is highly dependent on the radius of the nanowire. Changing the radius just a bit takes you to a completely different color. Now, when you measure the reflection spectra, you can see, you will see that each and every sample, this is also measurement, corresponds to a single dip in the reflection spectra, and that you can tune the position of this dip by tuning the radius uh, of the nanowire. So, you might think that this is an effect that uh, is a lattice effect because you have many nanowires, but this is the single nanowire effect, and as you can see here in this beautiful image of A and in this biofilter, each nanowire contributes one pixel to this image. So where does it come from? This uh, uh, effect c comes from the fact that silicon has a very high index of refraction in the visible part of the spectrum, larger than 3.5. So it localizes, it has very good transverse localization of incoming light. This strong transverse localization allow even the uh, uh, realization of resonance uh, electric and even magnetic transverse dipoles. In this resonant uh, condition, if you hit the uh, material in this resonance condition, you have very strong scattering to the waveguide modes of this uh, nanowire. So, we can uh, think of that all as a, a potential well for uh, the photons, and we know that uh, the width of the potential well basically sets the level, the energetic level 
of the uh, modes. So we know that if we change the width, we can change the energetic level, and by that, by changing the radius of the nanowire, we can control the reflection spectra. So you would assume that if we now increase the, the radius of the nanowire from 70 nanometer, which was the largest radius that we saw, to 100 nanometer, then we will see maybe another dip in reflection due to this higher order mode. But the nice thing with these systems is that they are full and very rich with physics. You have coupling effects and you always make very small changes and it takes you to a different physical regime. So this is also the case here. And if you change the radius of the nanowire from 70 nanometer to 100 nanometer, instead of this broad dip, we see this very sharp oscillating uh, uh, figure of reflection spectrum. So uh, the story behind this uh, measurement is much larger. This measurement is, the, is from a sample which is the fruit of an international collaboration between a group in Australia and a group in uh, Switzerland developing a new beautiful method to, to create the forests of nanowires without the use of an ebbing over very large surfaces and being able even to control, to tune the properties over these uh, large uh, uh, spaces. And here, this sample, they simply created the nanowires and changed this, the spacing from one location in the sample to another location in the sample over two centimeters. They gradually changed the spacing between the nanowires and they came to my office and they told me that no matter where, where they measure the reflection spectra, they get the same reflection spectra and the peaks also don't move so much. And they asked me what it can be. So I was a little bit puzzled, but I had several assumptions, but in order to make sure, I asked my student, uh, Rani Ditkovsky, to perform an optical simulation. So nowadays, we have very good uh, simulation tools. We can simulate the entire optical problem. This is like making an experiment on the computer. And when he did that, we got a very nice result which resembles very nicely to uh, the results that we get in the lab. But with the computer experiments, what we can do, we can easily probe the entire parameter space, something which is very hard to do in the lab. So this is what in exactly what we did. And this, what you see here is the reflection spectra, the reflection for wavelength and for nanowire radius. And you see that you have indeed very uh, rich physics going on here. So you can see that these broad resonances uh, named Psi 1 and Psi 2, which are actually this transverse localization, resonances due to this transverse localization, but in between you have a region where you have these sharp oscillations. In order to make sure uh, uh, what uh, is the reason for that, we can use our computer experiment and check a special points on, of interest and he actually look at the electric field to understand what happens there. And when we do that, when we did it, actually ex as soon as we saw the electric field, we were sure what was the phenomena. If you look at point B here at the reflection peak, you can see the incident light coming from the top and this is the nanowire, you see a standing wave pattern. You have the op optical waves coming to the silicon wafer, reflected, so you have this standing wave pattern that is formed. But its amplitude in air above the silicon carpet and between the nanowires is the same amplitude. However, when you go to the dips, you nicely see that you have this standing wave pattern, but the amplitude is much larger than in the air. So light is basically localized within this nanowire, meaning that what you have here is basically coupling to a wavegate mode that bounces back and forth between the wafer and the transition to air, and you get this what is known as fabry perot resonance. So both the fabry perot resonances and transverse uh, localization are the single nanowire effect. What about lattice effect? Do we have also lattice effects here? We have also beautiful lattice effect. So you remember that we can see here, or not, that the lattice changes from one direction, one place in the sample to the, to the other end of the sample over two centimeters is changing the period of the hexagonal lattice. So when you tilt the sample and measure the back reflection of light, this is what you see. You see that from different locations in the sample, you have this coherent 
uh, one color uh, reflection and this results from a beautiful lattice effect that can be calculated for hexagonal lattice and you can see how it fits very, very well with the measurement. So these samples, they allow both a transverse uh, a resonances. They, are, they allow us to have longitudinal localization of light and they open many new applications for color sensor, photovoltaic cells. We can increase the interaction between light and matter if we work at this longitudinal localization of light. We can even put molecules in these cavities because the fields are actually expelled in, in some words out of the nanowires and live in the air gap. So we can put molecules and detect them. Now I would like to go to the uh, second atom that uh, uh, we are working it uh, based on plasmonic nanoresonator. So uh, uh, John Pendry talked a little bit about plasmonics. We can excite these uh, coupled electromagnetic electron oscillations on metal and depending on the shape, the, the wavelength can be shorter than the wavelength in air. So truly nanometric uh, uh, particles allow resonant modes that also uh, uh, show this fabry perot resonance condition. So by changing the length, we can basically tune the interaction with light very well. What happens if we take this simple uh, shape of a cross shape that has one length on one uh, direction and another length on the other direction, we can get anisotropic interaction between uh, E and P. So what we get is basically a polarization sensitive uh, resonance and we get a length dependent resonance and we can do very nice things with that. And let me show you one thing, one uh, nice thing that we did with it. We uh, said we can use that to uh, attack a problem that is being uh, now uh, many groups in the world are trying to do it to fabricate a flat lens, a flat lens that works for broadband light. So usually uh, people take the phenomena of diffraction and take diffractive optics. So here you can see this phenomena, you modulate a surface and then uh, you can bend the wave. So if you create a lens, it will be low cost, it will be very flat and it will have potentially high NA and you can even correct the aberrations, spherical aberrations. But as you can see here, each wavelength is diffracted to a different location in space Therefore, it means that these lenses will have very large chromatic aberrations. Here you can see it as calculation of the distance to focus versus wavelength for such a lens. You can see that indeed every wavelength of light is focused to a different location in space. And if you look at optical simulation, the lenses are here on the left and light is coming from the left. You can see that light at 600, red light at 620 nanometers and blue light at 450 nanometers don't focus to the same position in space. So our idea was, okay, we can use this ability to tailor the anisotropic to create a surface that takes this dispersion relation, or takes this chromatic aberration and folds it in space. Taking one spectral regime and putting it with the other spectral regime so that two, uh, for Two wavelengths will have a, a mutual focus and by that we create polarization based uh, diffractive doublet. So here you can see a lens that was, was fabricated this way and you can see that it has several uh, sort of meta atoms, this uh, rod shape that can be in two orientations and cross shaped and if you design it well, you basically use it to focus light. This is white light. Focusing through this lens you see that one polarization gives you blue focus whereas the other polarization gives you red focus in a one millimeter away. You can look at it like that. Here is what you will see if you put it under the microscope. One polarization, we see one lens. The other polarization, we see a different lens. So it's like multiplexing two lenses on one surface and this is the focal point. You can do other things with that. We also showed that we can use this simple effect for a polarization control beam shaping and coupling and shaping of surface plasma to our polaritons. Now lastly, uh, I would like to show you that we can even control the uh, nonlinear optical tensor. We know that the interaction between light and matter in general is nonlinear. If we use intense laser light, then we will see uh, the higher order terms in this uh, expansion kick in. We will see this effect. For example, the first nonlinear term is the quadratic nonlinear term. 
uh, in charge for the effect of second harmonic generation, for example. But we know, mathematically, you can even see it, that if, if we have inversion symmetric material, all the even order terms in this expansion, they vanish. So we will not have any quadratic effects and any second harmonic generation. What happens with natural nonlinear material? With natural nonlinear material, we have either one atom in the unit cell that is a little bit misplaced or the unit cell is not centrosymmetric. So we see this effect of doubling of a laser beam. What happens with the metamaterials or with nanostructural materials? Even if most of the times we use a centrosymmetric media to construct these materials, we break the symmetry on the surface. And these metamaterials and nanostructural materials, they have many, many surfaces. So it is underappreciated, but these materials have very high quadratic nonlinearity. The idea is to understand how to access this quadratic nonlinearity, how to control the interaction, and how to make the nonlinear output radiate. To illustrate this problem, we can look at a simple gold rod. A simple gold rod shined with the first harmonic beam. So we can see the second harmonic which is uh, created. This is not just an illustration. It is a calculation based on the hydrodynamic model. So we see that the second harmonic is created on the rod, but it is confined to the rod. It doesn't go anywhere. We basically created a dark second harmonic mode which is eventually absorbed. However, if we change the symmetry of this atom, some of the light starts to radiate out. We continue to bend this atom go to this full, uh, what is called split ring resonators, you see that this emission is very, very efficient. This radiation is very e efficient, as was shown in experiment in 2006. Why is it so efficient? We can also look at the current to calculate the current. So if, so this is also calculation. If the first harmonic currents are simply circulating around the particle, the generated second harmonic current are mainly generated as dipoles along the arms. Dipoles along these arms, which are in phase, and the fact that we create in phase dipole means that they emit so efficiently. But by manipulating the shape, making changes to the shape, we can change the nonlinear uh, tensor. For example, inverting this uh, split ring resonator simply means that we locally inverted chi 2. And even this simple operation can take us a long way, as we showed in the lab. Basically, we show that we can use it to create what is called nonlinear photonic crystal to obtain a nonlinear diffraction shine, these uh, samples with laser beam, and make only the second harmonic diffract. We showed that we can create two-dimensional uh, nonlinear crystal. We showed that we can even use it to create second harmonic beam and scan them in space. And we even showed that we can create a structure that forms second harmonic and acts as a lens that focuses it uh, to a sample location. We even showed that you, can, you are free to shape the waveform of the emitted wave and in this, uh, uh, to, to shape the, the beams that go out. And here we have some advantages over a conventional material that I will not go into. But this opens a new, basically, a territory for nonlinear optics. And with that, I would like to acknowledge my uh, group and to finish and acknowledge my group of students that are working hard in the lab to find all these things and the funding agencies and to make a flu including uh, remarks. So Sir John Pendry, around the year 2000, you and others laid the fundamental concepts that basically inspired many groups to work in the field of uh, metamaterials. Many groups are working now. In 2020, I don't know what will happen. I just guess that this will, will continue to expand and grow. Regarding yourself, I hope that you will look exactly the same with the minor change. I hope that your glasses will be made out of metamaterial. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Of course, uh, that's my great pleasure to be here. Uh, so uh, I want to carry on with, with the line of uh, 
our distinguished speaker and talk about controlling electromagnetic fields with structures. Uh, and uh, I would like to start our preliminary discussion by looking at this uh, classical scattering experiment. So, uh, what do we have here? Uh, okay, so that's a kind of wave uh, generated by a kind of source and it falls uh, on the electric bo uh, body which scatters the field. Now, uh, let's uh, think about this process uh, in a slightly different fashion. So, this uh, material body, let's say it's made of uh, many tiny dipoles and each dipole will scatter the field. So, those dipoles could make a collective decision in the case of elastic scattering or individual in other cases. But how are they going to make this decision? So, they make the decision upon available electromagnetic states in, in the surrounding and of course upon the density of states available for radiation. So, now what will happen in free space? So, of course in free space uh, the structure of mode is given and if you want to tailor scattering we could only uh, change material composition of our scatterer, for example, or uh, uh, change its geometry. Uh, now, what will happen if we'll put all this thing in, in a structure, such as metamaterial, for example, which will enable us to tailor uh, electromagnetic modes and their density. So, how will look our uh, nice dipole, dipolar scattering in this case? So, that's just one of the examples that I want to give here. Uh, so, that's a nice di dipolar scattering in free space, but it will get very weird shapes if we'll start putting our dipolar scatterers inside metamaterials. Uh, and this example shows us one particular case corresponding to hyperbolic metamaterial. And that's the example that uh, I'm going to talk about. So, our metamaterial platform today will be hyperbolic metamaterial. And of course, I'll uh, spend uh, <coughs> uh, quite a few time <coughs> on describing uh, this uh, metamaterial concept. And then we'll take this platform and apply to uh, to various uh, different physical processes which we uh, will be able to tailor with this platform. So, we'll begin with controlling quantum processes. And here I'll talk about uh, spontaneous emission process and Compton effect. Uh, so, one of the works uh, will be experimental, the second one, one will be theoretical. Then we'll try to circulate uh, electromagnetic signals on nanoscale with the help of near field interference. He'll, and here I'll also touch a very important concept, new kind of concept of uh, uh, electromagnetic emulation of, or uh, analog computing and uh, we'll get to this point later. Then we'll discuss uh, scattering suppression or invisibility cloaking in a weak form and if I'll have time uh, I'll touch uh, <coughs> a thing which will enable us to tailor optical forces with metamaterials. So, uh, as I said, uh, our basic metamaterial uh, construction today will be hyperbolic metamaterial. And uh, let me start the, the preliminary discussion with uh, describing optical properties of uniaxial crystals. So, what are uniaxial crystals? So, we tend to think about them as those made of elongated molecules. So, those molecules are strongly polarizable in one direction and, for example, weakly par uh, polarizable in other two. Okay, and this will result in this diagonal uh, tensor of, uh, of epsilon. So, uh, along the molecules, for, for example, we have strong response and in the transverse plane, the response is weak. Uh, okay, there are many materials in nature which, uh, <coughs> which provide us uh, uniaxial crystals, but usually uh, the difference between epsilon ordinary and epsilon or extraordinary here are relatively small. So, for calcite, that's about 10% difference. Uh, but now, what we could do if we want to increase this anisotropy? Probably we could build material, metamaterial atom by atom, as Tal said. So, here, for example, we'll take gold nanorods and place them in one matrix, placing them one next to, uh, to another. Okay, so uh, very briefly about the fabrication process. Uh, so, here we could uh, take a porous aluminum template, we could electric deposit gold inside and then we could remove the matrix and what we're left with is the array of uh, densely packed uh, uh, metallic uh, nanorods, uh, gold nanorods in this case. And that's a speciality of uh, King's College uh, uh, London group led by uh, Anatoly Zaitz. Okay, so what, what happens here? So, we have our metamolecules that are strongly polarizable along one direction and very weakly polarizable in other direction. So, we think that electrons are free to propagate along the roads and the uh, uh, propagation in the perpendicular case uh, is forbidden. Okay, so the complementary structure here is metal dielectric layers. So, here the, the picture is uh, opposite. So, electrons are free to move along the layers in the plane of the layer and, uh, uh, <coughs> and they cannot move in the perpendicular direction. And uh, if you want to, 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 to talk about radio waves, uh, it will be uh, an array of uh, capacitors and inductors and uh, I'll get to this point uh, in a couple of minutes. Okay, so uh, wh wh which kind of uh, 
properties is of an interest for us, of course, density of states. So what's the density of states? Uh, that's a volume between two closely situated isofrequency surfaces. So what is the frequency surfaces? That's a geometric point uh, uh, where our k vector could lie on, right? So in free space, that's a sphere. So all those k, uh, k vectors in square should sum up to k0 square, which means that the geometrical uh, <coughs> shape uh, of the points where the k vector could lie on is a sphere. And the volume between two closely situated spheres is finite, which means that the density of states is finite. But here, if we are talking about hyperbolic metamaterials, and as I said, under certain cir circumstances, epsilon along those roads could be become negative. So if one of those epsilons is negative, and the isofrequency surfaces could get these hyperbolic shapes. And it means uh, that the volume between two closely situated hyperbolic surfaces could be infinite, immediately implying that density of states could be extremely uh, big. So what does it mean? So for example, if we put, put it an, an emitter inside, it will start emitting very, very, very fast, okay? And uh, the limit is virtually set by uh, the finite periodicity of the layer. So why this process is so interesting? For example, let's think about uh, kind of light emitting diodes functional, functionalized with hyperbolic metamaterials. So what will happen? They will start emitting really, really fast. So in principle, we could get very bright sources of radiation, which we could switch pretty fast. Okay, and even probably we could out, out, outperform uh, classical uh, semiconductor di uh, diode lasers. Okay, but again, that's only one example. And again, if we could control density of states, we could probably control many, many, many other processes, which I'm going to talk about later. Okay, so let's uh, start with, with a simple emission. So again, <coughs> that's our metamaterial, uh, the one uh, made of uh, elongated nanorods. And again, our theory predicts that we have a negative epsilon along the roads uh, after a certain wavelengths. Okay, so how do we test this hypothesis? Of course, we go to, uh, to uh, to the lab, make ellipsometric measure, measurements, we measure reflection and transmission, and uh, we are trying to retrieve back the material properties, okay? And that's what we did long ago. Again, here we plot extinction, that's minus log 10 of the transmission as a function of wavelengths. And see, uh, here we could see several extinction peaks. So again, if uh, our wave is TM polarized, uh, the, the interaction uh, efficiency is proportional uh, uh, to the scalar product between this uh, and the polarization of the wave and the direction of the road, okay? So, uh, uh, smaller the, this angle is, the stronger the, the interaction is, okay? So, that's what we see, that's experiment, that's a theory. They, they respond pretty well one with another, uh, making us think, uh, <coughs> making us think that uh, indeed we have hyperbolic metamaterial after 735 uh, nanometer wavelengths, for example. Okay, now we have this, prob uh, this uh, nice material, what's gonna happen next, we could uh, we could put a fluorescent molecule inside and measure its its lifetime. So again, we put a solution uh, of different dyes dissolved in ethanol, for example, and we measure lifetime by means of time uh, single uh, uh, time correlated single photon counting process. So what do we measure in principle? Again, we are not going to measure a single molecule; we measure a collection of molecules. Okay. So again, if we if we we'll take a, a nice behaving uh, emitting molecule, uh, it will decay in time exponentially, like a very nice two-level system. But once we'll start putting those molecules in a structure, we'll start getting uh, a mixture of different lifetimes, okay? The simplest example here is just the perfect mirror, for example, and one emitting dipole. If we put dipole in the uh, perpendicular direction to the mirror, it will interact with its image, and it will emit uh, faster uh, in, in two times. On the other hand, if our dipole will be parallel to the mirror, it will quench itself, and will almost not emit. And of course, all this depends on the uh, uh, on, on the distance between the dipole and the mirror, which means that even in a simple structure, instead of getting one exponential lifetime, we'll get a collection of lifetimes, okay? And if we want to extract this lifetime distribution, we have to make this uh, inverse Laplace transform and calculate the lifetime distribution, okay? So that's our formula. Again, what we are going to do, we could the spatial average uh, per cell uh, factor, okay, taking into account the uh, different processes and uh, tr tr trying to predict the behavior of, uh, of, of the emission uh, inside or in the vicinity of the structure. So that's our first result. Again, so the blue line is uh, just one dye uh, dissolved in ethanol. So it's, uh, it's not single exponential here. It's, it's kind of Gaussian distribution. So the, <coughs> the red line is a lifetime distribution of the, mol uh, of the fluorescent dye on top of gold mirror. Again, that's a solution. Many mo molecules are floating here. And green is our prediction, taking into account spatial average of per cell effect. So now what we are going to do, if we, if we would like to 
uh, explore the situation uh, where our molecules are sitting inside metamaterial, non-road metamaterial. So what we have to do, we have to uh, take our dipole in the simulation, we have to scan each particular place inside the material and make the average. Okay, so that's what we did. And finally, we go to the results. Again, that's uh, experimental data here. Uh, uh, so what do we see here? And that's uh, the intensity of the decay at the function of time for one uh, single die which I present here. Uh, so the blue line uh, is the decay uh, just in ethanol. The red line uh, it is what happens uh, if we put our molecules on top of gold meter. And that's what happens in metamaterial. So we see that we start emitting very, very fast once we place our molecules inside metamaterial. And those lifetime, uh, are lifetime distributions. So we start here with the blue line and we end up here with the green line. So the collective parcel enhancement in this case is about 30. Again, it shouldn't be compared to uh, an individual parcel effect. So if we put uh, an emitter in the cavity, we could reach very, very high uh, parcel enhancement. But the parcel enhancement, of course, depends on the position of the, of the molecule. If I displace it from the hotspot of the cavity, I'll get almost nothing. And here, again, we have huge, huge collective enhancement uh, of the emission. Okay, which means uh, that this concept of metamaterial is very, very useful for uh, getting very efficient emission. Okay, so that's just one example. And we could think about other effects, uh, like higher order effects, like component scattering, for example. So what's component scattering? We shine a photon and electron, the electron takes a recoil and uh, change, shift the frequency of the scattered photon. Okay, now uh, the Compton shift is, is usually, usually very small since uh, if we are talking about visible photons, their energy is very small in comparison to the rest uh, energy of our electron. That's why Compton scattering uh, is almost always performed with X-rays. So why is it so inefficient again? Since uh, the momentum of, of our uh, photons uh, is very, very small. However, if we put all the construction inside hyperbolic metamaterial, we could get access to very high k-vectors and in principle uh, get very significant content scattering with visible light. So we did some calculations uh, taking into account all losses, uh, making pro proper quantization inside uh, this hyperbolic metamaterial and predicting very high content shifts for visible light. Okay, so that's our recent work on, on the topic. Okay, now uh, I would like to switch gears and uh, talk about uh, signal routing, routing on nanoscale, uh, keeping in mind the application of uh, optical interconnect. And of course, we want uh, to make our optical interconnects as small as possible, and then we want to have a degree of control which will enable us to direct light in different uh, <coughs> to different points uh, points of space. Okay, and of course, our uh, platform here will be hyperbolic metamaterial, and. Uh, uh, the degree of control will be the polarization of a dipole which sits underneath uh, our uh, our metamaterial. So what do we see here? So again, that's a metamaterial slab, that's a dipole, that's a linearly polarized dipole, either parallel to the, to the surface or perpendicular to the surface. And in this case, we see that we excite both extraordinary modes propagating to the left and to the right. And of course, for efficient interconnect, that's not good since, again, I want to send my signal exactly to one point in space. So now what is going to happen if I take circular polarized dipole? Uh, okay, m making a simulation uh, without going to the, to, into the details, we could see that our extraordinary uh, wave is propagating only to the one side and other direction is suppressed. Okay, what, what is also very important since we have very high density of states here inside the metamaterial, almost all uh, the light goes inside and, and not scattered outside. Okay, and that's why in principle this kind of interconnect could be very, very, very efficient. Okay, now what should we do if we'd like to measure or uh, if, we, if we want to measure this process in optics, for example? And here we'll, we'll start struggling with, very, very, uh, uh, with a variety of, of different uh, problems. So again, we have to <coughs> control uh, polarization handness of our emitter. That's very, very complicated process since we have uh, to apply strong magnetic fields, for example. We have to position uh, the things uh, very precisely underneath our metamaterial. Uh, and here we are coming to the con concept of emulation experiment. Uh, so what's, what's the emulation experiment? Let, let me describe it in, bit in more details. So what's uh, the general engineering approach? So before we start building a big construction, we, we try, uh, we're trying to, uh, to, to build a small model. We make some measurements on the small model trying to predict the behavior of the big one. Okay, and we cannot be, uh, build a big one because of course we cannot fail. Uh, so now here I would like to propose to take reverse approach, okay? So we 
our goal is to study very complicated nanoscale process. Okay, so it's hard to fabricate things. It's hard to measure things. We have a variety of different uh, problems uh, that we have to struggle with. So now, what will happen if we we'll enlarge the whole uh, the whole system like 10,000 times or a million times? And instead of measuring nanoscale processes, we'll start measuring things with radio waves. Okay, where the fabrication and characterization is relatively easy. Okay, uh, let me uh, <laughs> let me put it another way and uh, uh, given an outlook uh, of of, uh, of this kind of emulation tool. So let's say that we'd like to model a kind of physical process. So what do we do? So we have uh, our equations, we code them in, in the computer, for example. Uh, so some electrons are running inside the computer, some electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic waves are running inside, and by the very end we, we get an answer, 17, for, uh, for example, or a field distribution in this case. Uh, and the kind of fundamental question that I would like to ask, uh, why should we get this long pass? Why don't we emulate our problem at the very beginning? So, but, uh, by the very end, we have to simulate our Maxwell's equations. So why uh, should we encode them in the computer if we could go and uh, let the nature to, uh, to to make work for us? Okay. So again, Maxwell's equations are scalable in frequency, so it doesn't matter much to which frequency we are going to solve them. Okay. We don't have to go to the nanoscale in order um, to solve the problem. We could go to the RF lab and make our analog simulation, and that's what we are going to do. Okay, so that's how we do nanoscience nowadays. Okay, that's RF lab, the one uh, that we have here at, uh, at Tel Aviv University. Uh, and that's our metamaterial, that's hyperbolic metamaterial. It's made of uh, array of capacitors and inductors. And that's our circular polarized emitter. Okay, and circular polar polarized emitter in radio frequency, that's, that's uh, uh, something which is really easy to obtain. That's just two antennas, 90 degrees one in respect to another, and pi over two shift in in the phase, okay, very hard experiment in optics and very, very easy experiment with radio waves, okay? And that's our overall setup which will enable us to scan fields. Okay, so I hold the antenna here, I'll scan the fields, uh, the near fields uh, next to our metamaterial and I easily could get the field map, okay? So people who, uh, who do optics here know how complex it is uh, to obtain the field structure if, we, if you do, for example, uh, SNOM experiments, right? So that's very, very, very tough experiment. Okay, so I have no time to, to describe why uh, this array is indeed hyperbolic metamaterial. And fi finally, and that's the results. Again, theory modeling experiment, again, uh, which showed that we could control the propagation of light with polarization handles. Okay, so left circular polarized light goes to the left and right to the right. Okay, so in the one minute that I have, I'd like to talk about scattering uh, suppression. So, of course, we saw this uh, nice picture today, uh, uh, and we all know what, what's clocking is. Uh, and the thing is that if, you, if, if we like to clock uh, an object which sits here, we have to have a pretty complex uh, function of uh, epsilon and mu. And the question is, uh, probably we could relax uh, some of uh, the constraints uh, by considering this simple structure. And again, uh, here we are not uh, talking about complete clocking, but we say that, uh, again, we'd like uh, uh, to hide an object which sits inside the metamaterial, so we illuminate it from one side. Our observer sits on optical axis, and what uh, he tries to detect is a footprint uh, print of the object which is situated inside. Okay, again, that's not all, uh, all angular uh, invisibility, that's just scattering suppression in one direction. Okay, so, uh, as I initially said, uh, the scattering process relies on the dipolar scattering, so here we plot uh, <coughs> the dipole scattering uh, of dipole situated inside metamaterial, different dispersion regimes, uh, hyperbolic regime, so we see here a kind of hyperlensing phenomena, that's a normal case, uh, almost in free space, and a very unusual regime where epsilon along the roads goes to zero, we see that our dipolar scatter uh, uh, radiates flat wave fronts. But what does it mean? If we we'll put our object inside the metamaterial which, which sits here, we shine a flat wave front, we get a flat fr wave fr front at the output, and the same happens here. So we have an uh, arbitrary body uh, situated inside the metamaterial, so that's our plane wave, it interacts with the body, but at the output we get exactly the same plane wave. Okay, it means that we don't have a, a distortion of the wave front. It means that we cannot detect what kind of object is situated inside. Of course we have shadow, it means uh, that in principle we could see the structure, but I say that uh, this kind of example where we play a shell game on nanoscale, so we do see the shells here, 
but of course we don't know where the bid is. Okay, and of course you could uh, realize how complicated ex this experiment uh, in the optical domain. So we go to RF lab and upscale the entire process uh, to radio waves. Okay, so of course we cannot uh, put a cat behind the bars. Uh, that's not the approved uh, experiment, but we take uh, an energy can. That's what keeps uh, our students awake in the lab. So we put the scan inside these rods and measure scattering. Okay, and that's the result. Okay, so that's a total radar cross section as a function of frequency. So that's a can, and that's what happens uh, if we put it inside the material. And here we could uh, identify clearly uh, frequencies where we almost completely suppress the scattering. Okay, so uh, if we talk uh, uh, on, uh, with electromagnetic language, so this object was as big as this one without being situated inside the metamaterial, and it became uh, to be almost a singular point, which is almost a scene. Uh, by the detector situated on the uh, on the other hand. Okay, so again, that's not a complete uh, invisibility cloaking, but uh, that's scattering suppression with relatively simple structure, and it works. It works in the lab. That's what important. Uh, that's it. Okay, so I have to skip uh, optical forces, but again, uh, we can control optical forces if we could control scattering. Uh, uh, acknowledgement. Uh, so acknowledgement to Anatoly Zaitz and his group at King's College London. That's my group here, slightly different faces, uh, but the same number of people. Uh, so we do many things here. Uh, so we do theory, uh, uh, quantum theory, uh, classical theory. We have optical lab, RF lab, all in the house. So students are welcome to join the resistance. Uh, there are many interesting things uh, that we could do. And, uh, and finally, the summary again. So I try to, to introduce a metamaterial platform, which is good for almost everything. And uh, uh, we talked about emulation experiment. Uh, so back to Richard Feynman. So he said once that we need quantum computers to simulate quantum nature, right? So uh, here we are less ambitious a bit, saying that we have to have analog computers to simulate complex systems. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> problems that console cannot solve. If you have many degrees of freedom, so it will be more efficient to to make an actual experiment than uh, simulating the same thing, thing in hope. So we're still not there, but uh, I see many problems which we actually almost unable to simulate, but we could easily measure. So that, that that's a long ter uh, term view. But again, with those experiments, we're, we're certainly not there. But again, uh, hiding the scan, uh, making this experiment will take a, a couple of hours and making a proper simulation Near, nearly the same amount of time, even with the, this simple system which, which appears here. So once we start complicating it, we probably could uh, do better with experiment. Uh. Okay. More questions? No, no, no. That, 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 that's just about efficiency. So. We, we for interconnection, we want both high density of states in order to collect light very efficiently and we want to direct it very efficiently. So in principle, we could put this, uh, this rotating dipole next to a waveguide and, and get almost the same effect, but again, the ratio, the, the amount of light which goes into the mode that, uh, that you would like w w will be minor. Uh, so I had no time to talk about it. We, we had this uh, publication in Science where we showed this effect for the first time, but the efficiency was 3%. So 3% of the light went to the plasma and the rest was just gathered outside. short uh, concluding remarks. So I want to thank the three Dan David Lawrence for the talk today and uh, the six uh, local speakers. And thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.